Niin. Hello, good morning. Sorry for the uh, switch around with the links. Zoom got confused by the uh, fact that both the AAAI Zoom account and my CME Zoom account were set up with the same email. So. Well, I think we are right on time, so. Okay. Um, yeah, I posted uh, the new Zoom link in the Rocket Chat, and um, I think they were going to post it on the, the conference website as well. Nice, nice. Hopefully, people find us. Who wants to share there? Uh, yeah, but uh, otherwise. Um, I mean, one thing we can do is we can just switch whoever is presenting to share so that we don't have to keep asking. Next slide. Yeah, that's pretty smart. Um, I think you. Yeah, I can. You, you hard. Hard. Yeah, well. yeah. Everyone, we'll just give people a few minutes since we had to switch Zoom links, a couple minutes to uh, get in, and then we can get started. Um, in the meantime, if you guys want to tell us, you know, where you're from background so that we can better customize what we're talking about while people are coming in. Uh, sure. So my name is Neil Gupta. I'm at 26 Labs. Uh, I research adversarial ML um, to some uh, platform work as well in ML. Um, I guess my interest in fairness and AI is both on the adversarial side as well as uh, sort of more policy focused uh, interest in like credit risk models that are still fair among uh, among a variety of users. Nice. Anybody else? Can you guys see my screen? I can. Yes. Yeah. And yes, people are coming in, just sort of get a little bit of context on, you know, we're gonna we're gonna really focus this tutorial on kind of being much more practical and hands-on in their kind of real world uh, rather than um, the, the research that's going on in this area because you know there are a lot of good papers to read and, and the, the reason for this tutorial was really to kind of fill that gap between research and practice so we're going to really make it much more you know, practical and hands-on so the first half will be talking through real world use cases and case studies but then uh, second half will be a lot more um, hands-on on the on on actually running code. Um, feel free to write code as well, but we're gonna we have pre-prepared uh, um, Python notebooks that you can run through, uh, and then we'll go, we'll go through that as well. Um, but, so if you're if you're getting ready, you know, um, if you want to also look look ahead and sort of see 
Um, actually, yeah. So the not sure the website has a link, but but if you um, look at the link for this tutorial, the GitHub pages, um, there are links to Jupyter notebooks and other things that we're going to be using throughout. Yeah, Peter just posted that in the chat here. I can. Yep, Pedro just, Pedro just did that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm just in. Yeah, should we just get started and then you know, people will, will come in? Um, yeah, so welcome everyone. Um, sorry for some of the Zoom link changes and so you might see people dropping in. Um, but yeah, let's let's get started. Um, we'll, we'll, there's there's a web page for we'll probably have to keep posting it every every so often um, for the for the Zoom Zoom um, is not the chat is not persistent as we as we all know. So yeah, so there's kind of a few different links just to get everybody. You know, there's going to be a website. There's a GitHub repo that you can look at afterwards as well. And then there are um, Python Jupyter notebooks that that are hosted on the Colab platform that we'll run through um, in the tutorial today. Um, and yeah, so it's about you know three hours. We're going to have a break, and we'll kind of keep switching switching from kind of breakouts and, and hands-on things. So hopefully people don't get too bored. Uh, but the 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 idea overall is to kind of go talk about start talking about kind of the, the overall fairness and equity at the systems level, thinking about how we build those types of systems. And then we'll jump into kind of the flow of where do where does typically bias enter into uh, an ML or AI or, or system and kind of go through different sources of bias through, through case studies. And then from there, we'll kind of move to what are the social and societal goals of a system to what the fairness metrics we care about. Um, and then auditing models for those metrics and for bias and fairness, and then taking a, a few representative methods for reducing bias and testing them out in practice to see what the impact um, is on both bias as well as let's say accuracy metrics. So that's kind of the, the plan for the next um, few hours. And feel free to, you know, it's a small small group. So, so feel free to jump in, you know, whether through chat or through uh, audio video and, you know, ask questions. Um, we can, we're pretty flexible in kind of which direction we go in and some of these things. So, so feel free to be you know, as interactive as, as, as you want. And then thank you for all the ones who, everybody who has video on it, it helps us, you know, have some idea of, of who's there and, 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 and who's not there. So uh, thanks for doing that. Um, yeah, so let's see. Um, maybe we can do intros before we, you know, just, um, so my name is Raid Ghani. I'm a faculty member at Carnegie Mellon and um, work in, I'm in the machine learning department and, and the public policy school and work across the two areas. So hence the, the tutorial, the intersection of, of a lot of ML things and and policy and, and, and social impact and um, been working with governments and nonprofits for the last several years, uh, both here and then before at University of Chicago. Kit. Uh, yeah, I'm Kit Rudolph. I'm a research scientist at Carnegie Mellon uh, working with Raid. Um, in his group, uh, yeah, looking kind of bridging machine learning and public policy and looking at uh, a lot of the, the questions that we're going to talk about here today through a lot of um, kind of hands-on projects with sort of state local governments. Hey everyone, my name is Pedro Salero. Uh, my background is in ML and I kind of got introduced to these topics um, when I worked with Rai at Chicago as a postdoc. Uh, and about one and a half years ago, um, I moved to industry uh, and I'm leading a research group on fairness and explainability uh, in, um, at a fintech company called Fitzai that works on fraud detection. Um, and yeah, that's it. 
Yes, yeah, so just give you a little bit of context. You know, we're going to bring in a lot of examples today from our work with governments and nonprofits. Um, and, and that doesn't mean that, you know, uh, this is not applicable for for tech companies. And, and you know, it's, it's, it's in some ways even more applicable because at least for governments and nonprofits, their mission involves being fair and equitable. That's kind of a requirement for them, whereas for a lot of companies that, that may not be. So it kind of becomes more important for them to think about these issues. Um, and so we'll give you examples from, from, from those things as well. Um, but a lot of our um, experience kind of comes from working um, with a lot of government agencies across health, education, criminal justice, policing, transportation, environmental things. Um, and so we'll kind of bring that. Um, and a lot of the projects that we might talk about, there are more details uh, at you know, one of the other programs that, that, that we run called Data Science for Social Good. Um, and then as we talk about a lot of these ethical issues, we're really focusing today on the bias and equity and fairness issues. But keep in mind that, you know, there are other, other areas that, that are equally important around privacy and transparency and trustworthiness and accountability. We're kind of zooming in today in this, in, in the bias and fairness world, but, but they're kind of interconnected. Um, so I think that we, I think we want to start with kind of a broad thinking about, you know, everything we're going to talk about today, it's not going to be new in, at, a, at a high level, right? It's, it's a lot of these types of questions around what is fair, what is equitable, uh, what values should a system have? Those things have been around for, for a long, 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 long time. Um, and I think that the thing that's sort of somewhat, um, different today is that we're trying to build these you know, machine learning AI systems that are used to, that, that are kind of making some of these decisions implicitly. Um, and so one of the things we want to sort of think through is, you know, what are the values in, in, in those types of systems, right? So when we sort of build uh, a, a, an image classification system, we might sort of pick some metric as to, to optimize, right? It might be some loss function, it might be, you know, saying we're going to improve accuracy or AUC, that basically tells the system what we care about. Uh, and if we sort of use something like, you know, um, accuracy or AUC, we're basically saying every, every single thing in my test set counts the same. So I'm kind of putting that value uh, into the system implicitly. And so the question here is, you know, when we build these things, they, they, they don't they don't come with any any societal values, any social values. We have to kind of take our values and put them in there. And a lot of times in, in ML world, we don't necessarily talk through that process up front to say, well, what do we care about here? Um, we, we sort of use standard things. Uh, and so the, today we're going to kind of think through a little bit deeper in these things. But the, the driving question is really going to be, what are the values we want? And then how do we have our have our analytical AI machine learning systems follow those those values. The other thing we're going to sort of think talk through today um, is generally today we're going to focus on building, thinking about systems that are uh, not necessarily autonomous, but they're helping make decisions. They're working with people in 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 the loop, right? So that could be um, things like providing, you know, we're going to talk through s s extra support to students who might need help in graduating on time, or it might be people who might be unemployed and need support in order to get back, uh, you know, get skilled in, in, in getting back to employment. Or it might be, you know, the hiring process of you're building a system that is recommending candidates to recruiters. They're not automatically hired. They're recommending to a recruiter I don't know, who, who to interview. Um, so they're really not autonomous systems. They're, they're, they're interacting with people in the middle. They're helping people. And we care about them having fair outcomes. And, and the reason we sort of talk about fair outcomes is really um, often we go to sort of get focused on um, the, the machine learning model in the middle being fair. And so one thing we're going to try to uh, uh, cover today is not focusing, the model is an important piece, but the model is one piece of the overall decision-making system. The outcomes are the things that we really care about being fair. The model could be totally fair and the outcomes can be pretty horrible, or the model could be unfair and you could mitigate that risk by, and we'll talk about some examples of, of why. But I think the two things to kind of keep in mind as we go through today is 
One is we're dealing with sort of human machine collaborative systems. And two is we're thinking about the outcomes of the system rather than just the, the, the what the model is doing in the middle. So, so here's, uh, we're gonna cover kind of four things. One is sort of overall at the, at the systems level, what, what are the considerations around fairness and equity? Second is once we know what we need to achieve from the social and societal side of fairness, how do we convert that into ML fairness metrics? Um, because eventually we're gonna, be we're gonna be measuring things through some of these metrics, but that mapping is, is an important piece. Um, then we'll get to, once we've figured out what metrics we care about, we're gonna audit um, these systems to see how fair or biased they are. And most likely we'll find that there is some bias and then we'll explore different bias reduction strategies um, to, to see how they affect uh, the, the, both the bias and the, and the performance and the accuracy of, of those models. So that's kind of a overview. And again, please feel free to, to ask questions and, and jump in. Um, yeah, so again, you know, this, this is gonna be important, right? Our goal, our goal as building systems is again, never to, it's not about the model being fair but the overall outcomes being fair. And here's an example, right? There's a, there's a project we're working on several years ago around um, uh, detecting kids who might have lead poisoning in, in the future. And the idea was that if you have, if you're at risk of lead poisoning in, at home, um, what the health department does is then they make an, they call the parent and say, hey, we think that your kid might be at risk. We need to come in and, and, and do an inspection to check for lead hazards in your home. Mm -hmm. Now, if we make the system, the model totally fair at predicting who's at risk, but then the phone call that the health department makes is in English. Well, only the people who can speak English are gonna be able to make those appointments. And so you have a perfectly fair model in the middle, in the beginning, but the actions are the ones that are causing the overall outcomes to be biased. Right? So, and the reason why we care about it is, you know, yes, our job is to build these ML models, but our goal is to have fair outcomes. And so we kind of need to think about the entire chain because otherwise um, we can keep focusing on the model and then the actions end up end up you know, hurting the overall system. So what we're gonna do is sort of generally think about the overall system of which the model is an important piece, but often, as I was saying, you know, the model can be great, the actions could, could be biased or the model can be biased but you can, act, you can sort of change your actions to mitigate that bias. And that's, that's important. And we're gonna come back to that a little bit later. Um, the second piece that again, we're, we're gonna keep coming back to is often we sort of, you know, when, when we measure the performance of these types of systems, and this is not limited to, to bias, right? Anytime we evaluate a system, we don't evaluate it at, is it 100% correct? We evaluate against some baseline, right? And and I think the same thing it needs to happen with with measuring for bias and fairness, right? So what sometimes what happens is that in in practice, when somebody's building a system, they'll sort of say, well, this system is biased, so we shouldn't use it. Well, it's biased compared to what? Um, it's not it bias means it's not perfect, but is it better than what the humans are doing today? And that happens quite a bit um, in and just for example, criminal justice decisions, right? We've all seen the issues that, that a lot of these systems have when, when making criminal justice recommendations. But something we have to kind of keep in mind is, well, what are we comparing that to? Um, are we comparing it to current judges? Um, and how do we measure their bias? And how do we sort of see, who, how do we compare it? If, the, if a system that we're generating building is overall better than today's judges, then the policy decision is, is it good enough? Is it worth implementing while we improve it um, because it's improving the status quo um, or um, does some other criteria need to be, need to be um, designed, right? So I think just like we do with other metrics, we kind of need to have a baseline. And today we're kind of looking at uh, a lot of human baselines um, just like we would in any other system. Um, so, so I think the first question when we start thinking, when we start looking at these projects, the first question that comes up is, well, where, where is the bias coming from? And often the, the first thing that we think about is all oh, the data is biased. That's kind of a, a typical 
process of, well, we think the data is biased. And, and yeah, the data is probably biased, but there are many, many, many other sources of bias as well in these types of systems, right? The biggest source typically is, is unfortunately the world, that the world is biased. And because the world is biased, it generates biased data. Um, and because of that, and there's a bunch of downstream issues, right? So I think that's kind of the biggest source. And we have to kind of think through think through the the, the that process because what you, what you notice is that you know when we build these types of ML systems that are, let's say they're predicting who's going to get a job. Now it's that property is not inherent in a person of if they're gonna get a job or not. That property is a function of the world around them. Do they have the right, were they given the right preparation? Do they know how to look for a job? Are there jobs that are appropriate for them? Are there jobs that can support them? Are the recruiters even gonna interview this person? So some of it is about the person, but a lot of it is around the context, the world around them. Um, and so when we build these types of models that predict something, they're not predicting something about inherent about the person. They're sort of taking how the world is gonna to react to this person, how the world is gonna behave and what the outcomes will be for this person in that context, right? So that's that's kind of something we always, every time we, we build these things, you have to kind of think about, well, conditioned on the world looking like that at that time, that was the outcome. That may not be the case tomorrow. So, so I think that's something to keep in mind. Um, the, the second is, it is data, right? So so the, there's a ton of bias that shows up in, and some of it is because of us building these systems, we choose certain data sources. So we might choose to say, well, uh, there are all these data sources I can get. I'm gonna focus on, on these two because the other one is too expensive to get, or the other one might have some other information that's biased. So we kind of choose data sources when we build systems, maybe build these models. Um, we also, the bias also comes from, you know, this is the most obvious one, right? Like we have pretty much most data has some sort of, of sample bias. It's not capturing the entire world. Um, and it's not missing things randomly either. So there is some sort of systemic bias, right? And we're gonna cover a couple of examples, but that happens a lot anytime we're dealing with, let's say social media data that we assume that it's representative of the world, but it's not because it's only the opinions of the people who are using that platform. Um, but it also happens in, you know, like right now, a lot of um, governments are using unemployment, official unemployment data to, to make sort of resource allocation decisions. And the data that they have access to most governments is the unemployment data from employers when they file for, uh, when, they, when they basically pay for unemployment insurance for the employees. So, so most of you, you know, if, you, if, if you're in, especially in the US, if you're in the formal job sector, your employer pays, uh, if you are employed, um, unemployment insurance, and that's the data they use. So anybody in the informal sector doesn't get counted. So the government thinks they have, oh, we have all this data, who's employed, who's unemployed. Um, but it, it has missing rows for people who are not in the formal sector. Right. So um, we also have a lot of measurement bias when some data, it exists, um, but it's wrong. And it's, again, it's not randomly wrong, it's systemically wrong, right? So for example, um, a lot of questionnaires in public health surveys are, big, you know, so depending on how you ask the question, you can get the wrong answer. So for example, a lot of the times when pregnant women are, are asked about their smoking or drinking or drug use, mm, they're, not, they're not probably gonna give uh, you know, an accurate answer in that context. And, and, and so that, that's, again, fairly common in a lot of different places. Um, that happens a lot in, in, you know, in politics and in, in voting behaviors. People don't tell you exactly what they're going to, depending on which country you're from. Uh, uh, and then the last piece that happens a lot is, is label bias, right? We, again, mostly assume in most ML models is that we've got no label noise, or we've got uniformly random label noise. Uh, we don't we don't sort of necessarily make assumptions about systemic label label bias, right? And and there are two ways in which a label bias happens, right? One is which we're a little bit more familiar with is when we're doing. We've seen that in the in the case of a lot of image classification algorithms getting getting you know people's race wrong or or being being racially biased, and that's because of the annotators possibly not having enough exposure. To, to a certain type of thing and getting those annotations wrong. 
but it gets more nuanced. So one example, you know, we, we worked on um, is working with police departments to predict which police officers are going to do horrible things in the future, use of force, uh, injuries, shootings. And the way that, that that process works is anytime, let's say a shooting happens or an injury happens or a use of force happens, um, the police department starts an investigation and an internal affairs team reviews that case and decides justified or unjustified. Right? And basically that's the label. The label is this was unjustified. Um, and so the models that you build are, are predicting whether an unjustified thing will happen for this officer in the future. Now, if you're a totally corrupt police department, you're going to say everything is justified. So you're going to keep labeling them as zero. Um, and so when you build the ML models, they're going to find, you know, nothing is bad. So you're going to keep predicting that it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. And, and the problem with that label bias is that for a lot of classification problems, you know, text, image, video, audio, you can go back and kind of correct the classification, right? You can sort of say, I'm gonna look at it now and see, can I relabel it? With these types of things, it's very hard to go back and say, okay, this case that you investigated four years ago, knowing what you know now, would you have classified it differently? So, so that's hard to correct some of these things that are prediction tasks where somebody graduated, somebody didn't graduate from high school five years ago, but it was because they didn't get the right support. Now, would you sort of go, how would, you can't really easily reclassify these people because it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's hard to fix that in the past. And a lot of these things end up sort of, um, end up uh, affecting kind of downstream uh, bias and, and, and fairness issues in, in these types of systems, right? Um, uh, the other piece that comes in after the data, let's say you're, you, you've kind of dealt with the data issue. This is sort of a stuff, all the stuff that we do, right? As, as, as machine learning people, we build these pipelines. We get data and we do a lot of linkage of different sources. We do a bunch of processing, we build models, we evaluate them, we then deploy and maintain and all these different things. Now, in each of these boxes, there are a lot of ways that, that sort of we make a lot of design decisions where bias can kind of unintentionally creep in, right? So the first one that we talked about the data piece, but then we often sort of do record linkage where we're getting data from a bunch of different sources and we're, we're, we're doing some record linkage stuff to connect information um, about people from different sources, whether they're customers or whether it's the health system or the criminal justice system. And most of the, you know, when we do record linkage, we, you know, we make mistakes, right? The, the models are, are wrong sometimes and they either mislink people, right? they miss people when they should be linked together or they link people who shouldn't be linked together. And what happens is that, that those errors are not necessarily random, right? So people who have long names with lots of consonants uh, next to each other, they get a lot more typos um, in different systems and they tend to get missed. And, and missing somebody means that you, you have less data on them. You might have missed their outcome or you might have missed certain features about them. And that's going to affect what the model does for them downstream, right? Vice versa, if we have two people who have very similar, you know, very common names or live on very common street, main street, the US, you know, every, every little town has a main street and, and every little town has a John Smith and they may even be born in the same, you know, uh, around the same time and our data errors, we, we link people together who were not the same. And, and we might sort of consider that, ah, you know, that's just a error in the record linkage process. But now what we've done is added information about this person that is not correct. And so now when we build models and features and labels for them, they're gonna be wrong. And they, if they're systematically wrong, then they result in different you know, wrong predictions for them downstream and could have lots of issues, right? Same for another little simple thing that we do often is missing value imputation, right? We, the most common thing is we'll say, well, let's just do mean imputation. Uh, I mean, you could do worse. You could re remove that row or remove that column, but let's assume, you know, we're all uh, better than that and we don't throw away any data. Um, we will do, you know, mean imputation. But if you now imagine a data set where you've got majority of the data is male and, and, and you know, let's say 10%, 15% is female in that, in that, in that system. Um, and you have a missing value for let's say height uh, for a female. If you do mean value imputation without thinking about it, you're gonna now make that, that, that 
female look more like male because you're going to take the mean value for the entire data set. Right. And you can sort of say, well, we could be smart and just do conditional means, right? Based on, but, but those types of things, like anytime we're doing imputation, we're, we're going to have to think about that piece. And, and, and now if you make this female look more like male in the feature space, then the predictions are going to get biased towards, you know, they're going to look more like the male predictions and they're going to be disproportionately wrong. So, so that kind of process of thinking through each step of what we're doing and thinking about what design decision we're making on record linkage, on imputation, on model choices, what's the downstream impact on bias and fairness of a system? That's kind of, kind of process we go through kind of for, for every, every project when we're kind of thinking about it. Um, I'll pause for a second if there are questions around this. I know we're going a little fast uh, or maybe not. Any comments or questions? Okay, uh, how are we doing on time? Uh, okay, um, yeah, we're, we're, we're so so the other the, the the kind of this piece is the piece we already talked about a little bit, right? On on the actions of in general when we're building ML models, we're not really building models because well, some of you know we like building models, but also we're building models because we want to do something based on that. We want to often intervene whether it's you know, uh, oh, sorry, we did get a couple of questions. Sorry to yeah, sorry. We did oh, get yeah, a couple yeah. questions in the chat there. Um, oh, yeah, sorry. If we're not doing it later, how do you usually tackle? <laughs> yeah, so I mean, one way of thinking about imputation is upfront, right? So, for example, in, in our work, what we do is for every feature or group of feature that we build, we explicitly come up with an imputation methodology, right? So, we might decide either we're going to flag it as so the, 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 the two common things, a few common things would be, you can sort of do a, a global imputation, right, mean or median or something. Um, the other one would be kind of more conditional on the group that this person belongs to. But the other one could also be to say, well, I don't really know what to do here. So what I'm going to do is flag it as missing. So that downstream, I can then do my analysis and see is my bias higher on people who I had flagged as missing gender or missing age or missing height? So, so one thing I can sort of do is be conscious that this can have a downstream impact and you sort of flag those, those features uh, for, that, for those people as missing. And then in your, in your analysis at the end, um, you can measure the performance of your system on those people versus the ones you didn't, that, that, had, that had values that, that were already present. So that's kind of the more, in some ways you're sort of, you know, pushing off the problem, dealing with it later. Um, but what we wanna make sure is that we don't do something and not notice it, right? So the, the, when we get to the audit piece, we'll, we'll kind of audit the overall system. And then if we find an issue, we can trace back to what the issue could have been caused by. Was it by through imputation? What is, was it through record linkage? Was it through the modeling choices? So that's kind of one way of, of thinking about it. Um, second question was how can bias come in with, with small data? Um, that's, I mean, I guess one question really is, you know, what do we mean by small data? It depends on sort of how, how difficult the problem is, right? So like the data will be a function of, uh, if the problem, if, if the behavior you're trying to, let's say, classify or predict is really simple, small data is fine. But one way to consider this is, what often one of the hypotheses that people have is, you know, when you have different groups in 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 a, in a data source, small groups, the, the models that you build get dominated by large groups because that's basically what your ML model is trying to do, right? If you're starting to say, I want to make sure that I get as many examples correct as possible, and every example counts the same, then large groups that have similar behaviors are going to be prioritized, and so. One thing that happens is that small groups get 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 their uh, predictions wrong or their classifications wrong, and 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 actually we're going to go a little bit you know in in the hands-on piece. We'll actually try one of these strategies um, of well, what if we we change distribution of the data? What if we sample in a way that we increase their 
their prevalence, what happens then, you know, in general, that's not going to fix the problem. <laughs> uh, but, but I think thinking about sort of if there are small groups that, that you want to protect, um, the, the question sort of becomes, you know, how do you, how do you get there? How do you trade off it? mean, if you take them out and you kind of build a separate model on them, you might do worse for them because the data from the larger group, some, some of it might be you know, transferred to the small group. If you keep them in there, your performance might get worse. So, so often one of the things is some of it is you can deal, deal with it through the modeling piece, but some of it is dealing with it through the interventions you do afterwards. How do you mitigate that risk? So, so I think there's something to kind of keep in mind. So what we're gonna focus on right now is how that can happen, but also how to detect it. And then the correction piece is the much more, much more involved piece. Um, and that's kind of this piece here on the action or intervention pieces. We're often trying to do something with the models, right? We might predict who is going to be you know, unemployed for long-term and then enroll them in training programs. And if the training programs are only effective for certain types of people, then again, the fair model applied to you know this intervention applied that's that's different, that has different effectiveness could will result in in biases in the outcomes, um, or often in the, these types of systems where you recommend to somebody let's say a recruiter that this person should be interviewed, they might say um, looking at their profile I don't think they're qualified. So they, the the model is doing the right thing, but this human review process is overriding the model's predictions uh, or recommendations sometimes for good. <laughs> And sometimes for bad, and and that's why you know it's not always wrong. But the the point is that if you measure the overall system and each each step, you'll sort of say things were fine here, and then things got biased here. So it must be it must be this middle piece. And a lot of it is obvious. I mean, um, but it's sort of in the in when you're you know in the middle of the, this whole workflow, we don't often measure these types of things. So that's kind of the 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 the, the goal here. Um, Okay, so we're gonna take a couple of examples um, um, and kind of talk through what are the different, where could different sources of, of bias come in in, in, those, in those examples. Um, and we're gonna sort of try to talk through, you know, where is the bias from data could be coming here? What could be the bias through, through the pipeline? What could be the bias through, through actions, through these case studies, right? So, so here's here's kind of the first case study, and this is something you know we've been working on with different school districts actually in both in the U.S. as well as in in Latin America, where the idea is that we want to increase educational outcomes, we want to increase graduation rates for students, uh, or the schools want to do that. And the data that we're getting often, in most cases, is data about each student, right? Their grades, attendance, demographics. Um, all sorts of things. And then we have data on um, outcomes um, of did they graduate um, from school? How long did it take them to graduate? Uh, and, and there's this, you know, if you if you work on education stuff, there's this source called, the, there's this organization called National Student Clearinghouse. They basically collect data on all the college uh, uh, enrollments and, and graduation. So, so often, student, often schools take their own data, get data from them and then link them together to figure out which of their students ended up in, in college and how did they do in college. So the analysis we do here often is we predict for each student, let's say we're in you know, ninth grade or 10th grade, we predict their risk of not graduating on time. And we use that prediction to allocate students into these after school programs. So let's say we have a, a school has a program that can take 50 students. They have a thousand students in that class and they wanna figure out you know, how do we pick the 50 students um, uh, or 10, in this case, 10% of students, let's say 500. So how do we pick 50 out of the 500 to allocate to this, to this after school program? And they'll do it based on kind of predicting that risk of not graduating on time. And so now what we want to sort of think through is if we are using this data, the student record data, to predict risk of not graduating and assigning them to after school programs, the 10% of them, um, with the goal of improving graduation rates, 
you know, how could bias kind of creep in into this type of a system from from different different places? So, what do people think on the like where could be where could be issues bias issues in the data in this case? Feel free to if you want to use chat or or unmute. So what could be a thing what, what in in terms of if we went and back to our data, you know, could there be sample bias anywhere here? Do we think some students might be missing in the data? Where how how could that happen? Um, is there sensitive attributes? Yeah, so something we did kind of didn't talk through a little and in this case is in these cases, you know, most schools know all these things about students, right? They know their race, they know their gender. Um, and, and one thing to kind of keep in mind is that often you'll hear, oh, you know, race or gender, we shouldn't use that because if we use it, our models are going to be biased. That's actually not true. Um, using them doesn't make the models biased. Not using them doesn't make them not biased. So often what happens is in these types of projects is if you, you know, is behavioral data is so much more important that demographics kind of are a proxy for that. Um, so removing race and gender type things makes no difference. But if you don't have them, then you can't even measure the bias. Like if you wanted to say, is my model biased on race? Well, if you don't have race, you can't figure out if it's biased. Um, but so somebody saying we could be only sampling students who had the means to fill out surveys, show up for analysis. Um, yeah, so if, if there's any survey data in here, exactly, it could only be survey based. Um, it could also be that you know students who move around a lot from different schools, we may not we may not know about them as many things. So, and it turns out students who end up moving, students and families that move a lot are also high risk of not graduating. Um, so that's they're already at risk of not graduating because of their their kind of home situation and their life situation. And, and this may be that we don't have enough data on them here either because they move around. Um, um, uh, another one is what about sort of things like in the case of, you know, one of the things we're doing is we're kind of connecting this, this data from this National Student Clearinghouse. There might be issues with, with, with linking th those things together. Um, and um, yeah, so, so one question of, you know, if, if you have, if you have very different behaviors across different school districts, um, and that might be an issue there. Um, linkages becomes an issue. Um, what about sort of on the on the on, on our analysis pipeline, right? With the one is linkage, but the other one could also be if we're trying to build this global model across all the schools, it may be that it's it's accurate for some schools and inaccurate for other schools. Um, and so we want to be able to sort of, as somebody mentioning, right, is if certain schools are doing better or certain schools have better support programs, students who look exactly the same at some point in time, depending on which school they're in, they might do really well because they have programs for them and other schools may not do well. Um, so we might think about sort of checking for performance, our models performance across schools. Um, and then on the actions piece, right, the same thing is it, we're, we're assuming here that this after school program is magic, where you put them into this program and students graduate. <laughs> um, it may be that the pro some programs are more effective than others for certain types of students. Um, and so again, you might have good data, good analysis, and then you put them into this program and only certain types of students do well because the program was designed um, designed for them. And, and so that's, again, that's, that's kind of an example of, uh, and we're, we're going really quickly, um, but, but you kind of go through each step, right? So, so here's another, uh, actually, let's, let's look at this one, right? Which is a little bit more on the data side of, this is again, a common use case that a lot of, uh, people are exploring right now, um, in, in different countries 
is a lot of disaster relief agencies, it's expensive for them to get send people on the ground and try to figure out what's happening, right? So one of the things that you've probably heard about is people are trying to use social media data in addition to satellite things to accurately assess damage and figure out what damage has happened on the ground and what relief resources to send. Um, um, and often they'll say, okay, can we look at uh, data from Twitter or Instagram or Facebook to geocode it within the disaster area? And can we use certain keywords or hashtags related to the, you know, a storm that happened? And can we take that data and figure out where damage happened and what type of damage happened and how much? Um, because they want to sort of use that to then um, one, assess the, the damage, but then more importantly, allocate relief effort. Like how much should we send? What types of things should we send? Is it, are there sort of housing issues going on there? Are there food issues? Are there medical issues? Um, and because they have limited resources for, for these relief efforts, they wanna sort of do this uh, in a way that they're not wasting wasting resources, right? So, so here, where's, you know, what are some of the biases that could come in because of the data sources? Yeah, so Zora is saying, you know, we, we access to internet is going to be a, is not uniform. That means, especially if you have, if you're in the middle of a disaster, uh, access to internet is going to be even worse than, than, than usual. Um, it's going to represent people with more access to, to internet. Um, so let's kind of think about it a little bit, right? So let's say you, you are more representative certain certain people will be more represented is there another type of bias could be that could be happening what is the implication of of certain people being more represented in the in in this analysis well so yeah so people ignored but i think it, it's because they're not going to go and help individual people, right? So, so if if two things can happen, right? One is that certain people being more represented means the areas in which those people live will get resources. Um, but even it could be that the areas where these people live may have different types of issues than the people in other areas. So let's say the people who are who are uh, tweeting a lot and posting about this are living in areas where the problems are really not infrastructure problems. And then there might just be transportation problems where, well, our, our, our roads are in bad condition, so we don't have public transit here right now. And that's the big problem. But it may be that the places that are not talking, that are not represented here, have bigger health issues or have, um, you know, there is no, there's no communication infrastructure that's gone away. And that's why they're not talking about it. And so then you're not going to send those resources, um, and that happens a lot. In again, in we're using disaster relief, but uh, you know a lot of again cities in the U.S. have these three one one type systems, right, or nine one one systems where people complain or people ask for services. Oh, I have graffiti in my neighborhood. Can you come clean it? I have my roads are uh, there is you know too much too many holes in 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 the, in the road. And what ends up happening is that if the city governments start using that data as a way to allocate resources, um, what often happens is that you know people in richer areas complain more, and their complaints are about kind of small things. Whereas people neighborhoods that have sort of high crime and other types of things um, have more issues, um, but they don't get talked about in these types of data sources, and so that gets left out, right? So the question here is how do you augment this type of data with actual ground truth? Uh, and, and how do you deal with that? But but it's sort of important to think about, you know, both one is kind of, the, in this case, there is sample bias, right? Everybody's not represented. Um, but then also that means that their geographies are, are, are skewed, their issues are skewed. That means that your analysis will be wrong because you might assess you, you miss a lot of the damage that happened in different neighborhoods and then your actions will be wrong because you'll allocate resources incorrectly. So that's kind of the, the point here is that we wanna start with thinking about, you know, the world, the data, our pipeline, our actions, and then kind of figure out where, what to do to kind of fix it. Um, should we, you know, 
fixing the data might mean trying to go and actually do on the ground work to to partner with agencies that have people on the ground like the red cross and some of these other ones um to see what's happening before you just instead of relying on 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 purely uh this type of data um and try to figure out how to be more more complete here um so the the rest of you know we're going to sort of skip past a couple of things but the rest of sort of the you know the way we think about these types of systems is once we've figured the reason we're trying to to sort of understand these types of issues is because what we want to do next is um yeah so as sean is you know another point is is those type of things are easy to gain right if you know that complaining and and that happens also right if you know complaining on certain platforms gets you faster response you can game the system by by doing that so that's another important point um so how do we and 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 the other piece is that this becomes this becomes sort of a um a reinforcing loop right where this data comes in you allocate more resources towards those that means you leave the other people behind who needed resources and that makes these problems even worse and that keeps increasing disparity so so using this data in its raw form and building these models and using it to allocate resources reinforces this this gap uh which is something we have to kind of you know keep in mind so in in a typical you know process what we sort of do is we first sort of start by thinking about what does it mean to be fair and equitable and so each of these problems right in the case of the school support programs or disaster relief what does it mean to be fair what does it mean to be equitable that's kind of the first step we have to think through and that's often not a not a machine learning question that's a societal question of what are the values we care about what do we want equity in uh and on whom right so once we figure that out we then measure now we can think about you know what are the actual measurement uh, things we can do what how do we measure bias then we sort of think about what were the root causes of that bias so kind of going through those different steps and if we find bias and we often find bias right let me see once we forget root causes we try to then improve the fairness of our analysis of the data of the models um but we find that the models can only go so far then they may or may not be completely fair so then we have to design our actions or resource allocation or interventions to mitigate the impact of of the biased system here and then we have to kind of be able to monitor and evaluate and see how we're doing and we keep going so that's kind of the typical process of we go through definition we then measure understand the root causes work on improving the models designing actions to mitigate the impact and then monitoring and 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 keep keep going um so what we're going to do now is kind of switch that was kind of an overview of the whole thing right now we're going to switch to kind of the first step and see well how do we even think about how do we figure out what metrics are are the right metrics for a given problem and and how do we how do we because again you've you know if you've read a lot of these fairness papers there are a million metrics there and so one conclusion you can get to as well uh i can't i can't get fairness because there are all these metrics and there are inconsistencies and 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 incompatibility things so i should not do anything or you can say well some metrics are more important than others for a given problem so i'm going to pass it over to kit um who's going to um uh, uh go through that section um but while we're switching feel free to if you have any questions or comments one thing we didn't mention is in as we go later in the slides we're going to be some slides with sort of a star marked those are things that we there are kind of more details or links to papers or other things that we thought would be useful to people but we're not going to cover them here so we'll just leave them in the slides for later reference for people to come back to and for the again those of you just to check you see the same slide that we were just on I'm sharing the right thing um yeah, so as Ray was just mentioning, right, the, the first step here is kind of thinking about what does fairness even mean? And that is something that is heavily um, context dependent uh, and, and also you know, not entirely a machine learning question, um, but very much kind of a societal question. What are the goals? What are the, the values of society, of the different stakeholders involved in this process? 
Um, and then how does that map into to machine learning fairness metrics? And, and I think something that's actually interesting here, and at least to my view, sort of um, a, a kind of good opportunity uh, is that a lot of the discussion that's happening right now about machine learning applications, artificial intelligence applications in, in different uh, domains, um, especially kind of in, in the public policy domain, but actually we also see this a lot in, in kind of industry applications as well, is there's this kind of conversation happening about uh, fairness of those systems and, and fairness of, of using uh, machine learning, AI, these tools. Um, but really, right, the, these should be conversations that, that fundamentally are about fairness of sort of the outcomes of, of these things, whether it's a human making decisions or a machine making decisions autonomously or some combination of, of both. Um, and so I think it's, it's a good kind of opportunity for us to take things that have been kind of uh, implicit values in systems in the past where humans have just been making, the, making decisions and you know balancing different error rates and, and things like that kind of implicitly um and now we have this sort of opportunity to talk about these things a little bit more explicitly but it also creates a challenge because now we have to actually take some of these uh things that are just sort of happening on their own and actually really start to map them to well what are the values what are the goals um and and what are the the actual ways that we think about measurement uh, so I guess kind of, you know, harken back to what Ray was saying at the very beginning, right? Most of these questions are, are not new. They're not particularly special to uh, this context, but we're, we're kind of seeing them through a new lens and, and often a, a much more kind of explicit lens um, and, and sometimes um, having impacts at, at a greater scale. Uh, so, so there are kind of particular things that we have to, to pay attention to, um, but uh, they are um, a evolution of uh, problems and, and issues that, that have always been there in, in any sort of uh, societal decision making. So as we think about this in the machine learning context, and, and like Wright was just saying, um, if you've read some of the papers in this area, there are a thousand different metrics that, that people think about, and for every one of those thousand different metrics, a thousand different names. Uh, the, I think that this research community hasn't really kind of coalesced around uh, either a, a way of, of thinking about fairness or, or a way of uh, thinking about any given uh, name. Um, so we're going to kind of try to stick to a little bit more the, the sort of uh, less, um, less exciting sounding, a little bit more kind of statistical, you know, we're uh, balancing the false emission rate, we're balancing the false positive rate, rather than kind of uh, some of the other names that, that are out there. Um, I think we have some references at the end of this slide deck if you want to, to pull up. There's some good kind of overview, review article, explainer sort of pieces. But, but again, there are, there are many, many different metrics. You could talk about, you know, statistical or demographic parity. Are, are different groups getting selected at similar rates? You could talk about uh, different types of parity that reflect different types of errors that the model might be making. Um, and here, a lot of our work really focuses around kind of more binary classification problems. And a lot of the, the fairness literature focuses in that area because it's a little easier to conceptualize. But of course, these also extrapolate to multinomial problems, to, um, uh, to regression sort of problems, and, and uh, the whole gamut of different things. Um, but you know, if we are thinking kind of in, in a binary classification framework, right? Of course, you have uh, the very useful, you know, Wikipedia stolen uh, confusion matrix chart um, that is is very handy to to give you all the the names for for everything. Um, and you could think about a fairness metric relating to any one of these these boxes, right? Uh, are you know, is the air is the model making uh, more kind of errors of inclusion, um, false positives, more errors of exclusion and false negatives. Uh, but then what's the denominator that we care about? And I think an important uh, result that's sort of come out of the literature uh, over the last several years has been the fact that some of these are, are actually statistically at, at odds with one another, um, that they're, they're actually incompatible. So for instance, just by inspection from the definitions, you can write down relationships like this, right? The false positive rate um, is equal to, you know, some ratio of the, the prevalence. So uh, heat P, here's the, the underlying base rate. Um, 
times some ratio of the false discovery rate um, times one minus the, the false negative rate, right? And, and this is just by the definition of, of these different metrics. Um, but, it, but just from that, right, you can see that uh, if we we're thinking about all of these things as fairness metrics. We want to balance all of, of these things across different groups. Well, if I had my false positive rate and my false discovery rate um, equal between two groups, say between men and women in a, in a certain problem that I was working on, um, but men and women had different underlying prevalences, so P was different for those two groups, then in this product on, on the right-hand side, right, I'd have, um, a uh, value that's equal across groups times some value that's unequal across groups. And if I need it to, to equal some other value that's equal across groups, then the false negative rates would have to be different, right? So I can get two of these, but I can't get all three being equal at the same time. Uh, and there were a series of papers that were kind of looking at, at some of these incompatibilities and impossibility theorems for different fairness metrics um, over the last couple of years. A lot of this sparked by uh, some work that people are looking at with um, some Bell determination algorithms that were being used uh, that many of you have probably kind of uh, uh, come across this uh, compass um, system that that people were um, looking at in the in the press and and realizing uh, had some um, uh, issues with fairness if you looked at it one way but it seemed to be fair if you looked at it another way. Uh, that, that led people into uh, to kind of thinking about this in a, a little bit more of a nuanced fashion, I think, than had been before. Um, so, you know, one kind of natural conclusion might be, well, if, if the only way to get, you know, uh, fairness across all these metrics at the same time is, is sort of perfect prediction, right, if all those rates are zero, um, then, then maybe that means we can't achieve fairness at all. Maybe we should just give up. Uh, and, and of course, you know, we wouldn't be here talking about this if we thought that was true. Uh, Certainly, um, it doesn't mean that, but it does mean that you can't get everything at the same time. So you really need to, to think about what does fairness actually mean in, in this context? And it becomes uh, really sort of a, a policy kind of um, values driven choice uh, where you're going to focus on maybe, maybe one metric, maybe multiple metrics, um, but understanding what it means for, for the particular problem that you're working on, for the particular stakeholders that, that you're working with, and, uh, and what that translates into for, for the machine learning problem. And then exploring if you are concerned about different metrics, perhaps from different stakeholder perspectives, uh, what are, are, are there tensions between those and, and how do you uh, kind of navigate those? And, and one thing sort of just to, on, on that slide, right, is when we were actually this this just came up in several conversations we were having with people in different government agencies where they either heard about that that those results or read them and their response was as Kit was saying is oh I read this paper that said we cannot get fairness so does that mean we shouldn't be using machine learning for anything because we can't get fairness right that was and and so the the papers are not making that claim the paper was are making a mathematical claim that those things are incompatible. But because they stop there, the, 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 the users of those systems are making that leap to say, well, we then looks like we shouldn't use ML, which means the existing process is better than, and that's kind of what, what led to us kind of thinking more about, well, how do you translate that, that ML result into an actual policy use? You know, how do we use that? How do we, how do we educate the, the end users to think about this? Yeah, I mean, I think there's two, right, like th this isn't just a, a straw man, it's something that, that actually comes up. And, and in part, there's that translation process between kind of scientific machine learning results that, you know, make this observation about tension between different metrics and kind of then, you know, filtering through press coverage and, and maybe a little bit more sensationalization to um, especially kind of, yeah, end users who may be less technical but are in charge of, you know, buying or using or or paying developers to develop some of these systems, um, and and exactly right that that they could make you know one of two conclusions from that right oh maybe maybe we just can't achieve fairness so so let's just put on the blinders and and not worry about it but keep using these systems or maybe it means we shouldn't use ML models at all except the you know the the fallacy with that second one right is 
is there's no machine learning in a confusion matrix, right? Human decisions have false positives and, and false negatives as well. Um, and again, that gets back to this kind of compared to what question that Ryak was talking about earlier of, well, you know, because it's not explicit, because it's not, it's not measured um, often in the same way, uh, people tend to, you know, kind of assume um, maybe not, maybe they wouldn't put it in those words, but they're kind of assuming under the hood, oh, the current system is, is fine or bias free. And it's only in introducing these new tools that we have to worry about bias. And of course that's not true. Um, so again, kind of sticking with that, that bell determination example uh, from, from Compass, um, uh, just because it's so kind of, you know, widely used in this literature. Uh, let's kind of walk through, right, how, how this might play out in practice. Um, so uh, different people might think of a system that's um, being used to make, you know, decisions about the nine bell as fair based on kind of different, uh, different metrics out of that confusion matrix, right? Um, so you might say, well, if the system makes mistakes about the nine bell, about an equal number of black and white individuals, uh, then we might consider consider the system fair, and this is actually often uh, the way that that we kind of see things in in a lot of press coverage, right? Oh, there were you know six hundred um, uh, um, you know uh, six hundred uh, white people wrongly imprisoned, and and you know four hundred black people, or or something like that, where m there's maybe kind of a, a lack of sophistication because. Um, one issue with with a statement like that, just based on raw numbers, of course, the groups may be different sizes, there may be different underlying prevalences. Um, so you might be saying, well, we, we need to, to actually kind of normalize for, for the, the size of the group. So somebody else might say, well, uh, maybe it's not that, you know, sim similar counts, similar number of people, but the chances that a, a given a black or white person will be wrongly denied bail is, is equal. So now, you know, we think of this as some conditional probability um, that uh, the chances that you're denied bail give among everyone in uh, one group or, or another uh, might be different. Um, this might, you know, make sense as a, as a metric um, in general for thinking about kind of the, the overlying, the underlying population as, as sort of the relevant uh, sort of denominator here. Um, there might be some tension here of, well, different groups have very different prevalences. Maybe we should be thinking about the errors relative to those sorts of base rates. Um, here, this kind of has some implicit value judgment. Of, uh, we think that fundamentally, maybe those prevalences should be kind of treated as, as similar, even if they're, even if they're not. Um, so you're, you're kind of ignoring them. Um, but if you were taking them into account, you might think of something like um, uh, here in this case, right? You might say, oh, uh, among the jailed population, um, we should just focus among people who are in jail, how, what fraction of them are, you know, shouldn't be there, should have been released. Um, or you could say among the, the fraction of people who should have been released, how many of them are, are kind of wrongly uh, jailed or wrongly denied bail. Um, so each of these kind of, you know, sterile metrics on, on the confusion matrix sort of can map into uh, a very sort of concrete um, kind of value, you know, driven statement. And, and I think that's the exercise that we're kind of trying to motivate uh, people thinking about um, is, right, if you're, taking this uh, um, question or, or this problem of defining bias and fairness in a given context, um, you want to think about, well, if I, if I went to the stakeholders and, and had to explain, right, what is, you know, you can't just say to somebody with little statistics training, oh, uh, we're going to balance the false discovery rate between these different groups, or we're going to balance the um, false emission rate between these different groups, but you want to kind of be able to uh, map that into into the context, and then really think about what does this mean um, for the context, and and sort of through this process, through many of the projects that we've worked on, uh, we kind of developed um, you know this sort of tool that we we call the fairness tree, um, which is is kind of a, 
a decision tree that, that helps us navigate some of these questions because some of these metrics can be feel a little bit abstract. And, and so uh, the first branch of this question um, or of this tree is, is really thinking about, well, is this a, a decision that, that might um, generally help individuals? So it's an assistive intervention where leaving people out uh, could do some harm, right? Not helping somebody who actually needs help. Or is it a punitive intervention? So more kind of like the, the Dell uh, denial sort of example, or also um, inspections uh, might fit in here where you're thinking about uh, inspecting different, um, uh, say restaurants for health and safety violations um, where there could be some, some kind of punitive nature there. Um, in which case, errors of inclusion might uh, harm the individuals that you're focusing on. And then how does that map into the different sorts of uh, bias metrics that we talked about above? Um, so here, uh, you know, uh, again, saying, well, what's sort of the, the relevant denominator? Um, and is, uh, are you, do you care about in, you know, the valve determination case, right? The, the population in jail, so like the, um, the false discovery rate might be relevant there, um, or the, the general population, um, so the, the false positive rates might be important there. Uh, for the, the assistive interventions, there's kind of a, a special case where we think about um, when you're only able to assist a, a very small fraction of the population, sometimes we end up focusing on recall uh, rather than say false negative rate. Uh, and I should note there that recall is equal to one minus the false negative rate, but might have some nicer statistical properties. So if you're thinking about uh, the ratio between two recall values, um, where you're only able to, to help a small percentage of the population at, with need, a ratio between a recall of you know 4% and 2% um, is, is a little bit easier to interpret than say a ratio between a false negative rate of uh, 98 and 96%. Um, you can see a little bit more readily that you're helping uh, twice as many of the um, people with need or a twice as large fraction of the people with need um, by, by focusing on, on recall or the, also the true positive rate or sensitivity, depending on uh, what discipline you kind of come from. Um, so this is a tool that we've sort of developed. It is not kind of the answer and, and there is no singular answer here. Uh, for many different reasons. Uh, a lot of interventions have, depending on what perspective you're, you're focusing on, some kind of uh, assistive and some punitive natures, and, and you could actually think about inspections that way. Um, and, you know, of course, this last branch comes down to, to stakeholder values. What's the relevant denominator? Uh, for the, the gel example, when you're looking at the, the population in gel, right, that might be kind of relevant because they can kind of observe uh, each other, have a sense of, of what the fairness of the system looks like. Um, but from different stakeholders, different perspectives, you might end up at, on different leaves. And this isn't prescriptive. Uh, this is kind of our way of, of helping sort of navigate these questions as a starting point um, to help kind of motivate the conversation and help sort of put some of these uh, more abstract statistical con concepts into uh, more concrete terms that um, uh, policymakers, those affected by decisions, might be able to to kind of help sort of think about um, and and really help motivate a conversation between them and, and machine learning experts who are building these systems. Uh, so again, this is a, a very kind of context dependent uh, decision that that really comes down to stakeholder values, and and we're sort of uh, providing this as and and really built it for ourselves as a tool to. to um, facilitate that conversation rather than, you know, point at, at a leaf and, and say that you're done. Um, I think it looked like there was some chat. Oh, good. And, and Pedro was. Yeah, but we're about to. Um, uh, so, and yeah, and, and just kind of, uh, I think these are a couple of slides that um, we're going to sort of skip over, but but kind of drill into. Um, some of the interaction between sort of legal and social uh, principles. Um, so how are we on time in terms of? Uh... Fine, we've got, yeah, so we can go through, we have another, we have 15 minutes. 
Um, yeah. Do we want to jump as a breakout or just kind of go through all together? I think given the 15 minutes, it might be good to kind of go through, go through together. Yeah. Um, so let's actually uh, then point this up. Um, so we still kind of have this fairness tree here. Uh, so if we're thinking about the, the student support uh, case study that Ray brought up earlier, um, how might we think about the fairness metrics that we might care about there? So, so just to, to start more debating this, if you had to describe to, you know, say the a school administrator, um, what does a false negative mean in this case? Yeah, so um, in the chat, student, you know, not being selected, uh, who should have been selected for, for the after school program or, or the tutoring or whatever the, the particular intervention we have here. Um, right, so in a false negative, there's a, a student who actually had need who uh, either wouldn't graduate otherwise or would have, uh, uh, wouldn't graduate on time otherwise. Um, and, and we miss them, right? We, we leave them out of the, the program. Um, yes, yeah, so it, depends, it depends on, I think, the chat question of a false student, false negative could also be a student who's classified as at risk and not graduating and and, and wasn't. So I think it, it, it really just depends on how you set up the classification problem, right? So we're basically just setting it up for now as because we want to identify this, this the number of the students who are at risk of not graduating, to focus on them, we're gonna we're gonna call that a one, right? So not graduating is one, graduating is zero, and so there's purely a just a uh, whatever we choose. So in this case, as as Daniel and, and and Kit were saying, is a false negative is is somebody who was classified as zero, so graduating, but was wrong. Uh, they were actually not gonna graduate, but we predicted they were gonna graduate. Yeah, yeah, and that's a good point, right? And if we flip the the one and zero, of course, um, that becomes a false positive. And, and what Jasmine was saying, uh, in in our you know uh, formulation um, with a one being not graduating uh, is um, is of course a false positive. So uh, where we select um, as a high risk and and give the intervention to uh, somebody who. Um, who didn't need it, who, who would have been fine otherwise. Yeah. I mean, in um, our case, so, basically, we're the ones are people we want to act on. So that's the reason for us formulating that way is the, the, the interventions are going to be on the ones and not the zeros. Yeah, and so then what are kind of the harms of um, these, two, uh, these two types of errors in, in, in this context, right? Which, which one feels a little bit more sort of salient? Yes, I guess what's yeah. what's what's worse, missing a student who needed help, or helping a student who would have graduated otherwise. Yeah, oh yeah, and it's in the chat. Um, yeah, so uh, right, false negative kind of feels feels like maybe it's it's worse here, right? The one is is sort of wasted resources, but the the other has kind of really a, a you know bigger adverse impact effect on. Um, on yeah, but it, I mean, but I think that's to Kit's point, right? That that's a that's a question. That's a societal values question. That's not a machine learning question. So you could be living in a society that says. Um, we can't waste any money. Every money has to be allocated to people who need it. And we don't care if it, if we miss people, but we can't, we have to be, and that's basically the framing of efficiency, right? Like they're saying efficiency is more important. So, you know, hopefully none of you are from Mississippi, but that's probably what they do there. Uh, uh, but 
the the world that at least we want to be in, the one we're trying to be in, it's it's the other world of it's much worse to miss people uh, than, and again, again we're, we're trying to kind of draw this very distinct boundary that reality is going to, like you can't waste all the resources because there's an opportunity cost, right? So every every person you help who who didn't need help because of limited capacity, you missed somebody else. So you can kind of, the, the reality is more nuanced, but which is why I think, you know, we're, we're not sort of claiming that this is the answer, but directionally we think, as you're saying, is, is one is more important than, than the other. And this, this, uh, this is actually also a super good point um, that we're, we're skirting over a little bit here. So there are stereotyping risks um, in, uh, and, and they have been seen in, in some uh, kind of student assistance programs where, where so that, um, that is to say where uh, you build this model of saying, you know, somebody's at risk for not graduating, people kind of internalize that um, and say, oh, I'm, you know, well, it's just hopeless then, right? That it's, it's kind of in the cards uh, and, and give up rather than um, uh, uh, kind of um, taking advantage of additional resources or, or things like that. So, and, and that has been a problem in some education programs. It, um, it comes, you know, I think, I think it kind of relates to, well, how do we talk about these things? How do we uh, think about them? How do we message around them to, um, to the, the people involved? How do you offer the support or, or provide it? Uh, so, so there's a lot more complexity, and I think when we kind of start off thinking about, you know, some of the other um, ethics and and um, issues around, uh, again, not just machine learning, but um, but any uh, any program, right? However, students might be identified uh, as as being at risk, though this is one where machine learning might be might add some particular flavor because people might kind of internalize that even. Yeah. Even more. Um, so, so it, it's a good point and, and something very, very much worth uh, thinking about. Yeah, and I guess um, we're, we're, you know the, the claim here is not one is infinitely more important than the other. It's more sort of thinking through priorities of how do you combine them. Right, like the one that that I, I often use the example that for me was was in the beginning not as nuanced and it became very nuanced was working with some people who work on on preventing suicides. Right. So if you're, if you miss some, in, in my, before I got into this, it was my, my thinking was, well, if you're missing somebody is much worse than, than flagging them incorrectly at risk of suicide. But then you talk to kind of suicide survivors who went through, you know, if you are flagged as at risk, you basically are put in into this facility that's, they claim is, you know, worse than jail uh, and worse than prison. And that hurts them and that affects. So, so it's not as, it's not as clear and a lot of these problems are not clearly, this is infinitely better than that, but this is a framework for kind of thinking through, if this is your intervention, this is what you care about, um, here's the metric that, that matters. And then, then you can kind of figure out how to, how to combine them, how to weigh them, how to prioritize them. Yeah, and so, so in this case, right, if, if we do kind of follow that thread of, um, we think those sorts of errors of omission are, are something that we might want to be concerned about. Um, that kind of puts us on, on the right branch of this tree here. What about the next step, um, right? So that kind of gets us down to these leaps of, do we care about, you know, kind of false negative rate, false omission rate? Um, this other one that we still have kind of a goofy name for, false negative divided by group size. Um, so that's that kind of first idea of the denominator is the whole population without regard to uh, actual labels um, or this kind of other concept of, of recall, um, focusing a, a little bit more on uh, true positives and, and inclusion. Um, and, and just as a, as a sort of refresher, right, um, the false uh, omission rate is sort of among everyone that's, that's left out. Uh, so if that's the denominator, um, the, the count of false positives uh, in, in that group among the, the people who are left out, whereas uh, so the people who the model thinks are, are at low risk, whereas the false negative rate, the denominator is uh, among all the kids who uh, did need the help, who, who weren't going to graduate otherwise, um, what proportion of those are uh, treated as low risk by the, 
model or the program as, as a whole. Um, so, and, and again here, right, uh, I think there's, there's not necessarily right and wrong answers, um, but uh, do you have thoughts on, you know, what, where, where you might land or, or uh, how you might think about this? Where would Yeah, so there's a question in the chat. Yeah, we're we're gonna figure out which which path would we go down for for this in, in the tree. And the font size is really small, so could, that might be another. <laughs> yeah. Or um, we have the other. Yeah, that's, a, that's a probably a better. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the question here kind of comes down to um, how would you think about sort of measuring, and, and these will sort of can land you at at different places. Uh, so is it take everyone who uh, who had need, um, so all the kids who wouldn't graduate otherwise or wouldn't graduate on time otherwise, um, and ask within you know one group versus the other, and and that might be uh, male versus female students, that might be by race and ethnicity, maybe by uh, socioeconomic status, um, or or kind of any other uh attribute that is um sort of of uh of kind of societal interest for for this uh question and take all all the kids in in one group who uh weren't going to graduate otherwise uh all the kids in uh the other group and then what fraction of them did you uh end up leaving out of um the the after school program um, so that that would be the false negative rate parity. The false emission rate parity is uh, among all the, the kids in that group that you didn't intervene on, uh, what fraction of them are um, uh, false negatives, right? What, what fraction uh, went, so end up not graduating. Um, the false negatives divided by group size is among all the kids in one group or, or the other, regardless of what the model says or um, or what their actual label is, uh, what fraction of them are, are false negatives. And then recall is basically the, the inverse of the false negative rate parity. Um, it's just among all the kids who wouldn't graduate otherwise, what fraction did you intervene on? Um, in, in terms of like how we often think about this, there there is actually some some difficulty here. The false emission rate is uh, is kind of always readily measurable um, because you you know those outcomes even even after you've done your intervention, uh, you still know among the the ones that you didn't intervene on who graduates and who doesn't. The false negative rate uh, can sometimes be difficult to measure depending on how your intervention works because um, you don't necessarily, if you intervene on, on a kid with the after school program and then they do graduate, you don't know what would have happened otherwise. You don't necessarily have the counterfactual unless you uh, set things up to, to measure that explicitly. Uh, but often, um, I think in a lot of our problems, often when we kind of talk to, to stakeholders, we, we end up sort of there because it's, it's some reflection of among people with need, how many people, what fraction do we intervene on? So how fairly are we distributing uh, our interventions relative to need? And then depending on the size of the program, we, we sometimes end up focusing either on false negative rate parity or, or recall parity, uh, which again, move together, but um, maybe a little bit easier to, to measure 
um, recall kind of puts the, the more positive, um, what fraction of, of people with need did we intervene on, uh, false negative rate puts it in, in the more uh, air focused um, terms of what fraction of them did we miss. Uh, but yeah, I, I one, one, one thing to sort of, one caveat here is right where all of these metrics are, are based on labels being present and labels being not noisy, at least not you know, um, uh, systematically noisy. So, so that's the caveat here is that um, a lot of cases, the labels as we're talking about those, there's label noise, and then and then this becomes more more messy. But again, this is kind of more of a way to think about and um, and a lot of problems that that the type of things we were talking about in the very beginning of the the human mediated problems uh, around you know education or criminal justice or social services or public health or in a lot of those cases you know we're kind of in this the small fraction of people can be helped which is unfortunate that we're there but that's that's a lot and so we end up in as kid is saying we end up in that branch quite often in those types of cases as we get more and more resources um for for problems and we kind of move towards towards the the right into the most people but yeah a lot of the problems we're going to talk about today are we end up in that recall parity world because we can only uh intervene with a small fraction and we have to prioritize rather than the other way around um so i know we have kind of the other cases but we're hitting uh it's just now 10 o'clock pacific uh should we go ahead and uh, yeah we can so i think right now we had a break schedule for so we'll, we'll we'll take a break but i think the break could be people can take a break or also ask questions um and then we'll switch over to the the more the hands-on part of auditing these models and, and bias reduction um yeah so we'll take a break for what 10 minutes 15. Uh, actually yeah you guys tell us if, if, if this 10 minutes work taking a break um okay let's do 10 minutes and then we'll come back at about one uh whatever whatever time zone you're in about 15 yeah. minutes after the after the hour um and then we'll answer and yeah if you're here just feel for done so yeah there's a question on if you have limited resources for per institution do you consider each region independently or do you use from the other the information from the other institutions so i think that's one of the things we sort of didn't talk about, which we're gonna talk about in the next section is how are we deciding what groups we want to be fair to, right? Like here, we're kind of focused on metrics. Uh, given two groups, we should have equal uh, false emission rate or equal recall. Um, and the reason we didn't talk about which groups you should care about again, is that's not a machine learning question, right? That's a question of, again, your, whether if, if you're dealing with a public policy problem, um, it's a it's a societal question. If you're dealing with a business problem, it's a again it's a business problem, right? So to your point, if you have schools all over the country um, and you want to get equal recall, uh, you might care about equal recall on male and female, regardless of 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 school um, or region. You might care about um, rec equal recall based on race or based on income or based on region or based on rural versus urban uh, because often you know certain resources exist more in 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 urban areas or in the u.s suburban areas have better schools and so those distinctions are very much again if you're doing um, hiring and you have a hiring recommendation system you might want equal based on again race or gender or um, different types of backgrounds. So I think all of those, were, were, th there is no systemic way of picking those. It's really more about what do, do you care about? And often it's not a it's not even a question that we should be, we as people building these systems shouldn't be the one deciding on that. That's it's not, it's not our decision. We should be asking these questions of well, who, who should, and we should be kind of be part of the process uh, but often it's the, the community that's going to be affected by these systems should be the one involved in helping figure that out. And that's the reason we're, we're not sort of prescribing any of these things here is that's not our decision. Um, but the decision has to be made because if it does, it's not, it's not made, 
then you're you're basically don't care about getting getting those. So what we're going to do in the next section is we'll actually go through and 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 for a given problem we'll try a few different attributes to audit on to to see what what happens. Um, yeah, other questions? Asked, uh, so let's see, I guess my question, if you're asked, we want recall parity based on race, then the result of allocating resources, looking at all students over all institutions might be different than allocating it all. Yeah, so, so you, might, you might sort of say, I want, I want recall parity, uh, but I want the recall parity, actually think of it, so you might sort of, so this is something we did in one of the you know, recent things is, you you have you want to have the ratio between two races recall ratio to be as close to each other as possible um but then you also want that ratio to be to have low variance across regions right so, so you kind of want two things you want you want the 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 mean recall ratio to be close to one but you want the standard deviation on that to be pretty low, right? Or some dispersion measure. So you could sort of have that as your as your goal, um, and 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 try to kind of get the best of you know for figure out some sort of. But again, those things don't come in with. Um, Kit, you're sharing everything. If you're, if, again, let's, it's just your email. So, uh, yeah. So I think, and I think that's the part that like you have to kind of think about. Which is not an issue. That it's not again an ML issue, but something that we have to kind of think about is, you know, you might sort of say, well, I want, I want to be, my recall ratio to be as close to one as possible on race and also on gender and also on region, <laughs> uh, and and it may or may not be possible to achieve it, right? So you want to first sort of see, and when we get to the audit piece, we'll see that is, is how do we audit them independently, but then. Um, Right now, it's it's not trivial to sort of try to get all of them together correctly. Uh, the question is, do we want all of them? Are there trade-offs? And then how should we decide to 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 come up with those trade-offs? Those are kind of all wonderful questions that are you know coming up these days that are, that are relatively new. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. You could easily game those things by say, oh, this is the school that that's causing it to go up. Let's forget that school. But now you've become unfair to students in that school. And again, that's a that's a social societal choice you're making uh, or a business choice. And I think one way we sort of talk about it is, you know, we can't control what happens when people do these types of things. We, but we want these things to be reported so that you can you can be transparent about it. Like right now, what we do is Again, if we build a model and we say we optimized for AUC and we report that result, we have no idea how you did. And so even the fact that you're separating these things out and just basic, you know, just reporting it for each group forces people to ask that question of, oh, you decided you were, you were okay with using this model that was unfair in this region for these students. Uh, was that intentional? What is unintentional? Um, and if it was intentional, you have to justify it. If it was unintentional, you have to go back and, and do something about it. So yeah, no, those are all, <laughs> those are all, and, and they're not just hypothetical, right? They actually happen in practice where, uh, yeah. I'll be back in a couple of minutes.
Andrew, you want to switch to your screen? I think he might have stopped my. Multiple countries, break down the metrics, put some more groups. Yeah, that's a you know, if if you're sort of again, if you're if you're doing I think part of it is sort of matters where you might have different groups of concern in different countries, right? Like when we talk about race, it means different things in the US versus, let's say, in other Latin American countries where um, you might, in, in some, in, I think it's sort of more which countries have systemic historical issues within certain certain people being left behind in certain issues, like, like that could be rural versus urban, that could be gender issues, that could be other background um, location things. So, so, so it, I think the way to sort of one way to think about this is you can do whatever you want in your modeling process, right? You can try different things. You can build different models. You can keep uh, at the end, you can sort of have this audit that Pedro is going to go through now and, and look at the results by all of those attributes and see, okay, here's what I did. And it resulted in uh, disparities in race in these countries, disparities in gender in these countries. Um, is that desirable? Uh, is that okay? Um, and and then when you kind of go through again, you can go through different different strategies. You might remove some data. You can add some data. You can try you know fixing other things, changing your models, separating things, and then audit again to see what you get. So I think partially it's sort of decoupling the the model building process and with, from the the audit process, um, which we'll we'll go through a, a little bit here. Um, yeah, so I think it, it's always those questions are always hard because the answer is well, it depends. It depends on what you care about, which is not just a, you know, it, it's it's not a, it's not a non-answer because 
there is no objectively correct answer. It, it depends on what what you care about and and we sort of have a certain view of the world and we want to sort of have certain outcomes so we'll focus on those but that doesn't mean that everybody else needs to kind of have that um, but we'll kind of give enough examples hopefully that that, that it, it's clear so yeah Pedro do you want to go ahead yeah sure um so um now in this in this part of the tutorial we are um really motivating um, how to audit and why should you audit uh, models for bias and fairness and um we are showing a, a toolkit that we developed um it's called Equitas, and then we'll go actually through one uh, interactive notebook that you can also uh, follow along on your laptop you just need a google account in order to be able to run on on collab but i will i will jump to that when when we get there so this will really sound like a cliche every time i say this is 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 something like and you know being in an industry i have to talk with these different stakeholders giving the motivation for auditing and it's really as simple as if you don't measure you can't improve it is the lord calvin cliche and um i think this is common in very different um domains different um questions areas or society when you start measuring something you start you create this awareness effect and you start working towards fixing if there is any issue um but if you don't measure you actually um you you, you don't know it and Sometimes um, I still feel when talking um, with, with, with different people from different um, companies that um, there is some kind of, um, let's say, fear of the unknown unknown. Uh, it's not that the systems that are in practice today, uh, they were explicitly designed to be unfair. Um, it's just that people are not aware of the impact of the AI that are being developed in terms of how it affects different groups of our society and what are the implications of having these uh, models in production forever and long-term effects. So that's why we built uh, this Akitas tool. So when I joined uh, Raid's group a um, few years ago, um, Raid really, you know, make this point that there are many uh, research papers out there about uh, fairness and it was even true back then and now even more um, but there are not many uh, tools that are easy to operationalize these metrics and how to make uh, audit for bias and fairness something that is very simple that is uh, widely accessible to uh, different types of um, stakeholders and, and personas and uh, the idea of equitas is to make the auditing very easy to run and being really systematic. It's very easy to create automation and, and, and audit for many different models and then under, then dive uh, in, in the results. Um, so it's not something that is very hard to, to, to run as simple as running evaluations. And so what do you need to audit um, the predictions of a model? Um, you need the predictions and you need um, uh, often um, you either have a predefined point in our ROC curve that you have a specific threshold that you set up, or uh, in cases as we were seeing today uh, on public policy problems, you often have uh, limited resources and you have a specific uh, top K percentage of uh, high risk people uh, that you intervene on. And you need to have that. Um, uh, define before running the audit and you will see that just that decision is also one source of bias because um, how do you deploy and how these systems are used in practice um, then we'll come up with different trade-offs we need the attributes that you do, that that define um, the, the the groups of interests for your audit and once again, this is something that should be discussed uh, a priori and it should be discussed with different stakeholders involved in different projects, understanding what are the attributes or characteristics of, um, um, of, of uh, 
people that are affected by the system directly or indirectly and um, that um, it makes sense to consider when auditing. Of course, in some situations, these attributes might not be directly accessible. There are all body of research on trying to um, tackle that issue. Um, although, as Raid was mentioning in the beginning, is 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 super um, important that even if it's a small sample, um, to actually collect some of these data explicitly and um, labels. And this is uh, in red here because um, one thing that uh, these audits uh, are not robust is uh, against these label bias. So because um, metrics or most of the metrics uh, that we use to compare um, in different groups in terms of bias and fairness, they are based or derived from the coefficient matrix. Uh, you need the true labels uh, for uh, in order to be able to calculate the true positives, false negatives, and so on. And uh, uh, Akitas uh, assumes that there is some sort of uh, random uh, um, uh, noise across the labels across different groups. And as Ray mentioned in the beginning, that often uh, is not the case. So the workflow is very simple. So we start by uh, uploading the data or using a data frame um, and you need the, the, the predictions, uh, ones and zeros, and you need the labels. Um, if you are interested, once again, in measuring uh, bias in terms of metrics derived from cohesion metrics, the attributes, you define which metric you want to uh, consider as your target metric for fairness, and then you get the results. It's very, very easy. And um, we designed uh, Aikitas uh, having different types of users in mind. There is a data scientist that when he's building and integrating the models, and as we, as Ray also mentioned in the beginning, can even be trying out different uh, imputation strategies. And you run the pipeline to that point and you see how that affects um, different, different groups. Um, so it's, it's really important that, and what we want to foster um, is to promote these audits are, as part of every evaluation um, process, uh, every uh, evaluation step in, in, in the whole pipeline. But there is also another type of uh, target user uh, in which here we, we call it a policy maker. Um, so is this partner, often is not a technical expert, is a domain expert, um, but they might not have a, a proper or specific um, background in statistics or, or literacy in terms of understanding different, different metrics and, and trade-offs. And um, the idea is to have this policymaker, um, which is usually from a different entity or organization than the data scientist, to before accepting the model to uh, go to production or to be used in practice uh, to uh, run an indep independent audit and um, make sure that it's aligned uh, with um, the equity goals of the project or if not um, and we'll see there is a loop to to try to to, to fix that um, just uh, don't accept the, the the model to go to go live and send it back and this is not something that you just do when you are developing models. This is something that should be uh, continuously and frequent uh, when maintaining models in production or in use. It's very important to define a specific time period to create a sample for run the audits. Uh, it can be a month, it can be a week. It really depends on specific uh, contexts and, and, and domains of application. Um, and it's important to uh, continuously audit these models for fairness because, as we all know, there is um, drift, there is um, performance degradation, and because most of these metrics also depends on, on, on the coefficient metrics, they, they, the, the system will also affect the, um, the outcomes for, for, for different people uh, because it might get more mistakes in specific groups uh, if as model ages um, or even when retraining the model and not do that automatically, often there is the 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 the, the shortcut of um, I have these model configurations uh, this is the best model I just refresh the model that's unquote that's a common uh, term that is very used and 
if there is data sh uh, data shifts uh, distribution shifts um, this, uh, this, this same model configuration might yield a model with very different characteristics and it's super important that uh, even if there is not the process of building features from scratch, of running hyperparameter optimization, just the simple fact of refreshing is, is super important to even when you switch the model to go live to, to, to really yield its four bias inference. So it's something that we really want to be part of the pipelines and be something that um, people do often and, and easy to do and, and, and different stakeholders to discuss on the way. I think, I think one thing to keep in mind, some of the things we're sort of covering, some of them sort of apply to a lot of you directly in your work um, or in your future work. Some of the things we're sort of mentioning because you're going to be in a position where you may not have control over what actually gets deployed. You're being asked to build something that's going to be taken and used or you're working in a, in, let's say you're working in a company and the company goes off and and buys a, you know, a service to, again, the hiring is a good example, right? There are lots of vendors that provide um, recruiting tools that companies use. And so you may not be in a position to build that tool, modify it. So what we're sort of suggesting is, and, and you're gonna see and we talk, show the, the tool that we built, which it's really simple. And part of it is it's, it's for a lot of those end users who we want them to kind of audit a system before they actually use it. That happens a lot more in government where the government will, will, agency will buy a system and uh, not, not test it for these types of things. So, so part of it is you know, you know, our role is building, if you're building these types of systems, you should use these things throughout. Um, but if you're also part of a process that's buying or using them, pushing for using these types of things. The other thing is that when we started building this, whatever it was, but three, four years ago or something, I can't remember. Yeah. Um, you know, there wasn't anything else. Right now, there are. This is um, this is not the only tool. IBM has a toolkit. Microsoft has a toolkit. Amazon, you know, AWS has implemented some of these types of things into their process. You know, H two O, Data Robot. So it's much more common, which is great. So don't you know the the the, the actual tool is is actually very really simple, right? It's just calculating the confusion matrix type things that we're gonna talk about. The, 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 the bigger thing is that embedding it into this process, like we don't, we're not used to doing it. And that's the bigger push is, is some something like this should be part of uh, building a system that's, that's making these types of, of decisions. Yes, um, and maybe I think now it's time for um, going. Uh, no, actually, we, we still also, as, as I was, was saying, back then, uh, there were no actual, uh, not many tools available. Um, you know, most of the things that we are covering today, they are not specific to the tool. So even you can replace this tool where, where whatever tool you are using, or, or, or if you are allowed to use a specific tool, or you just uh, allowed to use a specific tool. But in specific, in terms of, of Akitos, we have these three types uh, of, of, of interfaces. You can use it if, if you want some kind of a um, click and, and drop kind of approach. There is a very simple proof of concept uh, web uh, interface to when you actually can run it locally and it's more for non-technical people. They just, they can click a CSV, you can upload a CSV and, and run the audit or the common, the, the way to go would be a, the Python library and we'll see it on, on, on the Jupyter notebook. And there's also a command line tool for, uh, you know, automation of these audits uh, and, and push it to, to a database. So yeah, and you if you go to the the the, the repo, um, there is links for uh, notebook that we run here, also notebook for the with Compass dataset, and we'll just keep these. This is just for you to um, then see, and you can run it by yourself later. Uh, but now uh, we'll motivate uh, actually a, a real case study that we'll use uh, to the rest of the of the tutorial. Um, Kit, do you wanna do you wanna describe what 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 is the issues and what what is the problem? Yeah, yeah. So I, I can uh, quickly talk through. So the um, both of the hands-on notebooks are going to work on a uh, um, on an example uh, from this website called Donors Choose. Uh, they're a crowdfunding platform that is their focus is really on on helping fill kind of the 
funding gap uh, that is faced by sort of less resource schools in, in the United States by creating a platform where teachers can go online, post projects uh, that they're um, working on in their classrooms and, uh, and fundraise for, for money for, for resources for, for their classes. Uh, Pedro, if you click the, the next slide, I think there's just some kind of quick stats about, um, so they, they've already facilitated you know, nearly a billion dollars in, in donations affecting 40 million students. Um, so they're you know, at a pretty large scale, um, but even so about a third of the projects fail to meet their funding goals and, and go unfunded. Um, so if you click through the, the next slide, Pedro, uh, we're uh, focusing on, they, they actually made uh, a lot of their data publicly available for KDD Cup in 2014. Uh, so it's, it's out there, I think that actually, if you uh, go to the sides on, on the website, you can uh, link out to the raw data itself. Um, so it, it provides a, a good example of uh, a sort of project that um, is similar to the, the types of cases that, that we've worked on a lot and, and that we've talked about here, um, where the, the goal might be, well, we want to increase the fraction of the of projects that actually get funded um, using this data that is information about uh, projects, um, the resources that they're asking for, the, the description they give in pre-text, the ask amount, um, the uh, type of, is it a math class, a social studies class, uh, English class, um, some information about the, the teacher um, and their previous projects as well, uh, information about the, the class and some of the demographics of the students, um, as well as about the school. Um, and then of course the uh, donations to the project that they post, um, and that's at sort of the uh, transaction level, so every donation. Um, so you have all this information, uh, and we, you want to predict the risk that a project will fail to achieve its funding um, within four months. And uh, here we're, we're kind of, again, thinking about a resource-constrained uh, sort of action where they might have some hands-on um, kind of help for these projects, so identifying projects that they're gonna give some expert review and, and give some tailored suggestions. You might wanna rephrase the, the way you talk about the project. Maybe you should uh, ask for different types of resources. Um, so imagine kind of a, um, a pretty hands-on approach, which would you know, then have some uh, considerable resource limitations. So here we're, we're just kind of assuming that they might be able to help out a, a thousand projects with this uh, intervention on a sort of two month time scale. Um, so that is, is kind of the setup of uh, what this project might look like. Um, it's sort of a, a case study that, that it is readily available and uh, the CoLab notebook that I, I posted in uh, the Zoom chat um, will kind of look at some uh, first some bias and fairness audits and, and then later we'll uh, also look at um, some mitigation strategies. Uh, so Pedro, if you wanna, Okay, yeah, sure. Um, just um, I'll just ask you maybe it's if you can just share again the link to the to the web page or to the to the to the notebook uh, on on the chat. So um, we are um, going to um, start with uh, with um, with the end zone section of auditing a model, and um, basically. Uh, what is really nice about um, Collab is we just need a global account. We it, this is linked to our GitHub from the tutorial, and um, the way we frame this is uh, a bunch of models were trained um, and tested, and um, you will now have this kind of a high level overview of what is the precision at top 1000 as Kit was mentioning, which is our target uh, number for interventions. And um, I'm giving you some time. I, I, it's, it's, it's very straightforward. So I hope you can uh, follow along in, in your laptop and, and trying out I, I, as I'm running this. So we'll start with um, uh, installing uh, Equitas. I don't know why, but Collab doesn't support that kit as by default. We need to talk with Google. Uh, and um, then we have a link to 
the data path of these already processed data that we uh, created is tailored for this tutorial, which is in our GitHub from the tutorial. It's all available to you. Um, and so as I was saying, we already trained many different models and we now have a look to the distribution in terms of performance, which is precision at top 1000 of all the models that were trained in our grid. Uh, and basically we see that uh, the best model is around 0 0.55 uh, precision on top 1000 projects predicted as high risk. And now what we are going to do is something that is um, one potential workflow on using uh, Akitas, which is you pick the best model in terms of performance and you want to understand a little bit better how the model impacts different groups and you want to run an audit for bias of the best model in terms of performance. And um, so uh, recap, uh, what we are going to do here is to load uh, already a prepared data frame uh, that contains the predictions on the test set for this model with the highest precision at top 1000. And we will um, run an audit on that model. So let's have a look to how this data frame actually look like. So the data frame is already processed, pre-processed for the Akitas format. And Akitas takes only categorical variables as attributes. Um, so basically, if you have a continuous variable like age um, you should, uh, you must create buckets uh, that it is highly dependent on the application, which groups of data make sense. Uh, often there is this tendency of just looking to distribution and just create these buckets, but it's really important that the buckets are somehow make sense in terms of uh, how different groups of people uh, are using the the, um, the the system or being affected by by the by the decision making system that we are. Auditing, and this is just an example. So we have uh, the the score, the level value. Uh, we have three different attributes. So we have poverty level, and we binarize into uh, groups one, which is the uh, highest poverty level, and all the other are together as the lower. Uh, metro type we have uh, suburban and rural, uh, and this is something that is important because um, data is from US. And, and uh, what is um, uh, common is that um, actually uh, projects in schools from suburban and rural areas uh, are actually way better in terms of socioeconomic status than urban uh, schools in, in, in urban um, areas. And teacher sex, this is just the sex of the teacher uh, that submits the, the project uh, and the application in, in the website. So, so this is this piece is the one where we were talking about right doing the break. Um, some of the questions were how do I figure out which attributes, and I think what we're doing here is we're kind of showing a few different ways, right? So one is we want to make sure from a societal side, the poverty level, schools that are in uh, neighborhoods that are uh, have have higher poverty don't get left out, right? The second one is there are existing disparities that might uh happen in in the type of surroundings you know rural urban um but then the other piece is the type of person who asks for th there might be other issues there so we're kind of showing different examples of it but again that's the piece where you might care about something else um and you might care about you know the the which which subject is this resource being asked for? Is it for arts? Is it for English? Is it for science? You want to make sure that you don't miss, you don't, you know, perform worse for um, science projects uh, uh, compared to arts projects, right? So those are all things that we're going to skip for, for in this, you can, for this tool, it's just a column with, with it's an attribute with, with certain values. Um, but again, those values are, are, you know, uh, important and that as we talked about earlier. So um, this is just an inspection of uh, just confirming we have 1000 uh, positive predictions in this test set um, and uh, over 1600 um, predictive negatives. And positive uh, in this case is high risk of not getting funded. 
exactly of 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 not being able to get the the the, the target uh, funding value and uh, one um important aspect of the audit and i think we can also discuss here is because the audit, uh, the the tool is um you know comparing different groups using ratios to so disparities um we uh, define a, a target reference group which is uh, always used as the denominator uh, on these ratios um and there are different ways of setting up uh, these reference group uh, but as uh, the, the, is actually is, is similar to 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 the, to the rationale that uh, Ray was saying in terms of the attributes. Um, ideally, it, it makes sense to have a very specific discussion of which reference group makes sense on the specific uh, uh, application in this in this case. Um, of course, there are other strategies that we also support in the tool, like the largest group. Um, um, but that 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 is uh, there are some nuances there as well, depending on um, where where the population, what type of population on 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 the on the project you you have access. Uh, and um, in this case, we define as reference the groups that are better off in terms of poverty level, so lower poverty level. The metro type suburban rural is following the same reasoning in terms of. Uh, socioeconomic status in terms of teacher sex um although we um we we are interested in measuring impact on the students as Ray as Ray was mentioning um we want to see if um students are being somehow hurt uh, by the sex of the teacher uh, um, uh, uh, submit, uh, submitting the proposal. Uh, of course, we are not doing a causal analysis here, but it's to see how in different groups that that there there might be some disparities about that. And we opted to use male as a reference. Another very important step is basically what we discussed before the break: which metrics make sense to use. Uh, here, um, because we have a limited um uh, resources for intervention uh, and because the intervention is assistive you're providing uh, interventions to uh, try to help these projects that are at risk of getting to, of meet to meet their funding goals um so uh, uh we decided to go with recall parity uh, so our target metric is recall if you have higher resources available, uh, probably would go with the other right side of the fairness tree in terms of uh, looking to the false negatives. And this um, tolerance here um, is something that is more indicative. So uh, it is um, here is, 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 is often used just to digest a little better the results of the audit. Um, this is something that is user defined. Um, there are papers out there that use this 80% rule that is based on specific uh, judicial um, decisions uh, in, in, in specific cases on, on US courtrooms. But this is very, very arbitrary. Uh, and um, this is just for us to have a notion how far uh, how, how the, the degree of the disparity in between different groups. Um, and we can go with this 130. If we wanted to have exact same numbers in terms of the, the way of auditing, it would be uh, close to one. And this is some sort of a tolerance of different groups might fall in. And then uh, this is running decade as itself, the audit. Um, two main methods, as Ray was saying, one is just creating across tabs of confusion matrix of, of for each group. And then the second part is just calculating the disparities based on the reference groups that we pass as a dictionary. And now we add it. And now we can run visualizations that the tool supports. First one, we are going to focus on poverty level. And this will show uh, disparities. And this is a a easy to uh, uh, easy way to visualize ratios. So uh, this was something that we were struggling for a while, how to show ratios between uh, between different groups, and we came up with this 
um, solution with, with, with this simply, simply uh, we are stretching out the ratios. So you have this notion on times larger, times smaller than the reference group. And if it is below the value of the reference group in terms of a metric or is above, it will be on the left side of the chart or on the right side of the chart. Uh, the uh, uh, radius of the circles of the bubbles um, are um, the, the relative size of the group compared to the old test set. And the point where it lands is the actual disparity compared to the reference group. So in this type of disparity charts, the reference group always sits in the middle and uh, the other groups then either on the left or on the right side. And in this case, what we are seeing here is actually that um, there is a lower recall for um, highest poverty um, applications uh, from highest poverty regions and schools. And um, actually, this is something that um, in the, here, what we are seeing in the second plot is the actual absolute values for the true positive rates. And also we show the bands. I forgot to mention the bands. So the 130 he just controls the width of this band. And here we translate this band in terms of ratios to the actual values compared to the value of the of the reference group. And I think and, the, mm -hmm. the two the distinction really is, you know, for, for us who are kind of in the middle of building this system, it's it's sort of the second thing that they're showing you. That's kind of what we're going to use, right? The first one is really for kind of the the, the decision maker, the policy maker who eventually wants to say pass or fail. Like we did an audit and if it's outside this band, the disparity is it, it failed, so we shouldn't use it. We, you know, for, for us, so that's why we've kind of built in, we're kind of showing you a menu of things and, and they're typically designed for different types of users. So for us, we're gonna, we care about the actual absolute value more um, because we can then be more nuanced about it. Yeah, and in this case, the the group that uh, at highest precision is actually um, not helping in terms of in terms of recall the same uh, proportion of uh, projects that are at risk of not getting funding uh, for the highest poverty applications compared to the uh, lower uh, poverty, um, which in terms of equity goals, uh, it's 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 definitely contrary to what we expect the project like this to uh, even at least be as equal as, as lower poverty and not, uh, uh, not being as effective for uh, different groups based on poverty levels. Yeah, so let's, let's put, so Laurie had a question. So in general, we are gonna be treating ones as, as projects we wanna help, we wanna do something about, right? So one is predicting who's not gonna get funded because then we want to focus on helping them. Um, so that means that uh, our, our TPR or recall um, projects with the, that are from schools that are in low poverty areas have a higher recall than projects that are in areas that are high poverty. So, so that, that, that gray bubble is our we're saying low poverty schools are, are kind of the reference group, which is only if you care about, you know, like you don't need a reference group. You can, well, if you look at the, the two, all this is so telling you is that projects coming from schools with high poverty have, have a 2.7 something percent lower recall than projects coming from, from lower poverty areas. That, that, so there is a disparity here where our model, and this is purely at the model level. This is not saying anything about the data or about anything else. It's purely, we built, we built a bunch of models. We picked the one that had the highest precision at top thousand, right? So we kind of focused on precision, our metric, we picked the best model and then we audited it and we found that it's, it's recall is overall, the recall is the best recall of all the models we built, but there is a disparity in recall between projects that are from low poverty areas and projects that are from high poverty areas. So that's kind of the, the, the setup so far. And ideally they would be, uh, and yeah, so now we're gonna go and say, okay, there was disparity in poverty level of the schools, 
are there other disparities in the other metric, other attributes that we care about? And um, confirming, um, as we were saying, uh, socioeconomic status on, on urban areas um, tend to be lower than suburban and rural uh, schools. Um, and this can basically what we are seeing here is similar to what we have seen before. So, and the, the, the project is uh, missing uh, or not helping as much um, uh, uh, projects that, that come from urban uh, regions than projects that we don't know what, re what type of uh, region um, um, they come from uh, and the reference group which in this case is suburban rural and once again as I said what we are interested in seeing is the difference in actually absolute values on TPRs um, between these um, these groups, and in this case, the TPR on urban is around 004. Actually, you cannot see my my highlight, my overlay, but I, I assume that you are running on your lap on your laptop, and you can when you mouse over, you see um, this tooltip that actually shows you the value of of TPR. So TPR for urban was 004, and for the reference group was 014. So it's why it's uh, almost three times smaller than for the reference group. And then finally, let's have a look to the teacher sex. And in this case, we can see um, also that are, can see there are different disparities here. So uh, actually the female group is the largest group on, on, the, on the test set. And the model is doing fairly well on, 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 on uh, applications that are submitted by uh, female teachers uh, and on male teachers, uh, which we use as reference group, as a lower uh, TPR, uh, three times, three point something times uh, lower. And actually, let's look to the numbers. So the reference group has 0 0.03 TPR for male and for female, we have 0 0.10 um, TPR. Any questions here so far, right? No, I think, again, th this is, we're sort of going through right now, you know, a, a, a model selection process that was kind of bias agnostic, right? It was focused on our performance metric. So as we started the top and said, we built a bunch of models. And then we picked the one that had the max precision at 1000, which is also the same as max recall at 1000. Um, so we kind of picked the most efficient model. And now we're just looking at saying overall it's the best but it did it perform so the, the calculations underneath it are pretty straightforward right we're just separating these groups and calculating recall separately as opposed to together so so you no know, statistically it's doing a very simple just breaking it up and say and we're finding that there are disparities now the question becomes and and this is kind of the more basically it's a each, at each step, we go deeper and deeper and deeper, right? So at the first level, it says, there is disparity, it's large. The second level, it says, here are the actual values of those metrics. The third level, it says, and here's the actual, here are the metrics underneath it, right, for each group. So for, for people like us, we wanna go to the level of how many false positives, basically get the entire confusion matrix. Um, but if you're the policymaker, you wanna, you're at the level one. So, so we're just kind of showing you each level, you can keep going down and seeing seeing more details. This doesn't tell you anything about, you know, correcting or fixing, which we'll get to in in the next. Right now, we're imagine that you know you were given a model, um, your your company, your government agency, you bought a system, it came to you, and now you're saying, well, does it? Yes, it's the best overall performing one, but does it does it do fairly on these groups that I care about? And the answer here is uh, not really. It's worse for low poverty schools, or high poverty schools. It's worse for urban schools, and it's worse for teachers who are male. That's kind of those are the three things we found, right? Based on based on doing this, um, and so this is a summary. Right? So now the question is. Is, is it good enough to use? Um, and if it's not good enough, could we could we could we do something better? Could we improve these these disparities? Um, 
And so that's kind of what we're going to go into next is our flow. Today, our kind of flow is we build a bunch of models, we pick the best one, and then we deploy it. Right? And now we're saying, no, 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 we need to kind of have this step in the middle where we we sort of test, we want to be sort of more bias aware in our workflow. So we want to test for the bias audit. Then we go through different bias reduction, bias mitigation strategies. Then we go back and audit. And we keep doing until we're happy with, or happy might be an over, you know, until we're satisfied <laughs> uh, with, with, uh, with this performance. And then we go and deploy. So that's, so now we're going to sort of go through and, and see, could we have done better if we, if we were thinking explicitly about bias as opposed to picking the best model based on precision or some other some other aggregate metric. Um, so, uh, well, I can do this slide and then pass over, right? So I think that the things that we're gonna fix, so there are different ways of, of trying to reduce bias, right? The best way is to fix the world. Uh, and and we hope we get there. Uh, not gonna get there today. Maybe maybe tomorrow. Uh, so, but but kind of we're going through that. Phase. Okay, we can fix the world, and hopefully fixing the world reduces some of these things. Until we fix the world, well, one thing we can do is we can try to we can kind of try to fix or modify the data that's coming in. Um, and so one thing people often do is. Um, say, well, what if we remove age or race or gender? What if we remove the sensitive attributes from our models? And, and we already sort of, we're not going to actually empirically try that here. You can 99 plus percent of the time, that's going to make no difference typically. Um, because as we said, a lot of these attributes are, are kind of, you want them to audit, but they don't really add to the, removing them doesn't remove the bias and adding them doesn't increase bias. They're just um, they're not they're not that, that that useful. So so that's kind of one one thing people tend to do, um, but usually has no no impact. So we're not going to go that in this in this tutorial. The second one people have sort of people often will do is they'll they'll kind of they'll adjust the 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 distribution of the data. So the, one of the hypotheses people might have is well in my data there's a group that's really small, and because that group is really small, my model doesn't. My model sort of fits the larger group. Let's say if I have a lot more uh, projects from um, low poverty areas, um, my model is trying to optimize for a global objective, and so it gets those right and misses the the the, the and doesn't get the, the the high poverty right. So what if I resample my data and I make them equal? Maybe that's going to do a better job, or maybe the the prevalence of the, the, the classes is different. And so what if I make them the same? What if 80% of the projects from low uh, poverty get funded and only 10% uh, of the projects are, are maybe, you know, uh, other way around, right? So maybe have a higher prevalence for one group. What if I make them the same, right? So we're gonna, we're gonna explore that and see what happens. The other thing I can do is, you know, when we build models, we, we, don't, we don't sort of say, the best model is going to be this neural network with this architecture with these parameters. We do some sort of a search over a bunch of hyperparameters and different models. Could we do something better there? Could we, instead of picking the best one on one dimension, could we look at, could we do better model selection? Not change the models, but, but in our larger space of models, could we pick one that was more fair? Another one is, you know, in our, in our objective function for our models, we might, today we sort of, most of those objective functions include, uh, you know, some form of fitting on training data, some form of regularization. Um, could we add another term for fairness in there, to so that the model explicitly uh, optimizes or is designed to, to be? Um, and then the last piece would be, you know, could we do something once the model is built? So, like the model that Pedro was just showing, it has it has a ranked list. Could we adjust something? Uh, could we pick the top people from one group and the top people from another group and, and, and combine them to kind of get a better um, better result? So, so what, what we're going to do now, um, um, I think, then is, is go through a few different ways in which people have explored reducing bias in the, in the models. And then we're going to go back to notebooks to actually try all of those things out and then audit them to see what was the impact on both the
the precision of the overall model and then the fairness on the dimensions we were looking at. So, Kit, do you wanna take over? Maybe, do you want me to go through, oh yeah. And this is not an exhaustive review of all bias reduction strategies. Right? We're sort of taking representative examples from each each thing to sort of say, you know, pre-processing on the data side, in the model, in processing, and then post-processing uh, type approaches. Yeah, yeah. So it's a, there, there's a lot um, out there, and and you know, more and more. Uh, different methods and approaches that, that people are proposing every day. So this isn't, you know, kind of a, a complete review, but but more sort of scratching the surface and just kind of uh, really trying to go for breadth rather than depth. Um, so a bit of a rural winter of, of different things that are out there um, and, and trying to provide some references and starting points. Um, so as Ray was just saying, uh, something that, you know, is kind of, I think, a fallacy that's, that's out there a bit. Um, is is this idea of kind of fairness through unawareness that oh if I admit you know race or or, or sex or poverty level then my my model can't discriminate right if it doesn't know about these things how how could it um, but the the problem is uh, that one there are a lot of correlated attributes with these things uh, and I think if you look into a lot of the history in the United States around things like redlining where people were choosing different zip codes to to make lending decisions, um, you see that that there are many different ways that you can uh, can that the model can pick up on on differences um, that are very highly related to to these attributes that you care about. So in practice, uh, much of the time, at least, we find that you know just emitting these variables doesn't make a difference. Um, if it does, it can make a difference in either direction. It, it can it can sometimes make things better, um, sort of just by luck often, um, but it can also make biases worse. So, uh, so this is is kind of an unfortunate, maybe seems natural, uh, but but doesn't play out um, the the way that you might hope. It, it's there's not an easy solution, and, and this this isn't it. So we're we're not really going to focus on that in in our hands on portion, um, but it's certainly something that you could go back and, and look at with. But one thing I, I wanted to sort of emphasize here is the reason we're kind of pointing this out is two, two things. One is a lot of people building models feel uncomfortable using these attributes because they're feeling like, oh, I'm, I'm introducing uh, bias in my models if I use race or sex. So it's just like this we get that feedback a lot like oh i don't want to use race because i might be introducing bias in my models um and that's sort of an a priori assumption so what we sort of say there is um you should use it and you should remove it and then you can see if, if you don't you if you don't have it at a minimum use it for audits so you can see if you are biased and then you can take put it in and take it out um and even in cases where you might let's say the race affects the results. If, you're, if your action is to help somebody and adding race gives you a better prediction on them in order to help them, then, then it's okay to use it because it's the intervention that matters, right? So again, if you took out race for somebody and their risk of not graduating went down and you were wrong about it, so re removing race under predicted and then you didn't help them, then you became basically you, your model is now racist. Your interventions are racist because you didn't use race. So, so what we sort of often say is you should use it and then decide what the right thing to do is after you audit. The second reason for kind of making a bigger deal of this is often if you're working in certain organizations, maybe the the the, the legal side of it, you know, the lawyers might not not for legal reasons, but just again for liability, reasons, they might say, oh no no. We don't want to use race. We can't. We, we can't use it here without thinking through this process. So we want to kind of equip you with the tools to go and sit, make an argument for why collecting this um, or using this is important if you want to. If you care about fairness and bias, because you can't really get those things otherwise. So, so that's the kind of the. It's really more for you to be, be prepared for those conversations. Um. Yeah, so, so then kind of 
thinking about maybe the, the overall hierarchy of the, these different approaches, um, we can think about bias mitigation as, as right, this is kind of overviewing through either pre-processing, in-processing strategies or, or post-processing strategies. Um, pre-processing being things like re-weighting, relabeling, um, changing sort of the input data, ideally even changing the world. Um, in processing being a little bit more uh, the the kind of methods that, that we see a lot of uh, ML papers being published on around regularization, constrained optimization, uh, trying to, to add some term to the optimization function uh, as we're learning the algorithm to, to try to enforce some sort of bias constraint. Um, and then post-processing, uh, thinking about different types of calibration or, or thresholding um, to uh, uh, take a model as a black box and act on, on the scores after the fact. Um, so we'll, we'll kind of give a, a brief, really like a, the, the two minute version of, of each of these uh, options um, and then dive into uh, another hands-on notebook where we look at, at some of the impact of these on our case study uh, in the, the last um, half hour or so of the, the uh, tutorial. Um, so as we think about fixing the input data, let's zoom in a little bit on kind of resampling and, and reweighting. Um, here, we won't kind of go into to a lot of the methodological details, uh, but as, as Ray was kind of talking about in, in the introduction, the, the general kind of intuition here is, well, maybe the model is not really caring about errors that it's making on smaller groups. So maybe we care about uh, making the group sizes more equal because it's um, it just cares about errors overall, um, and so making errors on on a small group um, just kind of get uh, um, overlooked uh, in in the optimization, um, and, and we want to sort of tell the model that no no those are are actually um, as important uh, not on a you know individual one to one basis but but kind of on a group to group basis. Um, or uh, because of, of differences in the underlying prevalence, um, maybe the model is, is picking up on, on this attribute as, as very important and sort of doing something like equalizing the prevalences or, or even just kind of tinkering with the prevalences uh, tells the model how important kind of this group membership is um, and causes it to uh, result in, in more or less uh, biased um, uh, predictions. So um, we'll explore a couple of options for, for different uh, resampling methods. Um, there are, I think, a, a lot of options out there and a lot of sort of free parameters when you start to, to jump into to resampling. Um, but we'll, we'll take a look at uh, how that works out in our, our case study. Um, another, you know, kind of broad uh, way of thinking about this is saying, well, we can run a, a big search of different uh, types of models, different hyperparameters for those different types of models. And they will probably have not just different performances on uh, whatever metric we kind of care about for, from that perspective uh, in terms of accuracy, whether that's AUC or precision at the top 1,000 as we're looking at here, or F1 or, or F theta. Um, but they, they'll also probably have different performances in terms of uh, fairness. And we can think about now uh, turning our model selection strategy into something that, that considers both of those. So, you know, traditionally when we're thinking about model selection, we think about a single performance metric. We run our, our large grid of, you know, thousands of different uh, model types and, and hyperparameters and have some single metric that we then line them all up on average performance across uh, different holdout sets or, or whatever, um, and, and choose the, the one that, that does best in terms of generalization. Uh, but now we can think about this more as kind of a, a adding a second dimension to our, our model uh, selection strategy. And then this gives us um, something that's a little bit more of an explicit trade-off, right? There might be, if we're lucky, maybe there's a model that you know, is kind of in the, the top right corner here that performs best both in terms of um, our traditional accuracy sort of metric as well as in terms of our fairness metric. Uh, but often um, we're going to see that some models perform uh, better on one and maybe a little bit worse on, on the other. And then again, it, it comes back to um, 
figuring out what the, the right sort of trade-off is, what the right weighting between these two goals uh, is. And that kind of comes down to less of a machine learning question and more of a, again, contextual kind of policy question of, well, how much, uh, um, you know, kind of overall accuracy are you willing to sacrifice for, uh, for better fairness? Um, and, you know, and, and even quantitating um, or quantifying that. Uh, so it becomes a challenge and, and often in, in practice, what we kind of end up thinking about is sort of a menu of options of going to, to policymakers and, and making it very explicit. Well, we could choose, you know, this model that, that is the best on the performance metric. And, and here's what it looks like in, in terms of fairness. We could choose this model that's best on the fairness metric. Here's what it looks like in terms of performance. Here are maybe one or two options that are, are kind of in between and sort of seeing, you know, navigating for them uh, what, what that choice looks like um, and what the, the trade-offs are in, in very real terms, um, not just of, of metrics, but uh, here's how many people you would help of, um, uh, in different groups and, and here's how many mistakes you, you would make uh, in those groups. Uh, so you can, of course, um, there's references in the slides. You can think about sort of Pareto frontiers um, and, and ways of, of trying to do kind of more um, bias informed searches. Uh, so, you know, drawing into a, a level of, of getting a little bit smarter with this as, as well. Often with these, you, you have to think about, you know, some particular kind of weight parameter between your bias metric and your performance metric. Of course, that's also very much true um, when you start thinking about in processing and regularization techniques, um, which is uh, the next bit that we'll uh, talk about quickly. Um, so there are many, many methods uh, that are out there, uh, a lot of different papers. But in general, the, the idea here is uh, we want to add something to uh, the general um, optimization that the, the model is doing, where we, we add a, an additional term, just like when we're adding a, a regularization parameter for, for kind of showing the, the coefficients of, uh, say, a, a logistic regression. Um, adding a, an additional parameter that says, well, now we care about group fairness with some uh, way to, across that. Um, and so you, you can look at the slides for uh, several different options that are out there. Um, this one uh, from, by Zafar has a um, implementation that, that's available uh, in um, Python. Um, uh, I think this is a figure from, from their paper. So I, I won't go through all the details because there are many different options um, and really want to get to the, the hands-on bit, uh, but um, refer you to the slides to, to take a look and, and uh, grab some of the papers. Um, I think there are, uh, I know Fatstar just announced their, um, uh, or I guess it's fact now, uh, they're accepted papers, so I, I imagine there's there's even more references that, that we don't have out here, um, but but hopefully this is a good kind of jumping off point. Um, and then the the last option uh, is well, what if we treat the model as a black box? We have these scores, these actual outcomes. Uh, is there something that we can do at that stage? Um, there's a, again a variety of of work kind of looking at. Uh, different options here. Um, this paper uh, by uh, Maurice Hart and colleagues um, looks at, uh, they, they're actually looking at uh, what they call equality of opportunity, which is what we've been calling this uh, recall or true positive rate parity, um, and looking at how they can do some post hoc adjustments essentially by studying different score thresholds uh, for different groups to, to equalize for um, uh, recall across groups. Um, so again, I'll refer you to, to their work. Uh, we looked at a case study in some of our work, um, looking at the cycle of incarceration and, and kind of applied this. And um, so maybe I'll talk through that in just a minute or two as a very quick case study. And then we'll jump to the, the donors choose case study that we've been working with the hands on. Uh, so here we were looking at uh, this um, cycle between people with unmet needs, uh, whether those are, are mental health challenges, uh, homelessness, um, joblessness, uh, that um, the, those situations uh, often lead them to uh, be arrested for misdemeanor offenses, that 
man's them in jail, but jail is obviously a, a particularly terrible place to, to meet some of these challenges. Um, so often what happens is then it's even harder to get a job, uh, harder to find housing. Um, so the, the unmet needs um, worsen and, uh, or at least fail to improve and they get kind of trapped in this cycle. Um, we were working with the city of Los Angeles to think about ways to um, think, find diversion programs that tailor interventions to, to some of these uh, needs. Um, and so we were building models to predict risk of, of somebody being reincarcerated uh, and then looking at how we could identify people to, to intervene with um, uh, diversion programs that, that keep them out of jail and, and hopefully meet these needs and, and break the cycle of incarceration. Um, they were only able to intervene with a, a small fraction of, of individuals and tailoring and creating these interventions was a very, very hands-on process that involved a, a lot of kind of uh, casework and, and looking at the individual's uh, particular circumstances. So that kind of led us um, back to this uh, idea of kind of recall parity, uh, equality of opportunity, true positive rate. Um, so we, again, went through this, this process, built a bunch of models. The models are optimized for, for efficiency and, and not some idea of equity or fairness. Uh, and then choosing a model that um, could identify 150 high-risk individuals uh, and looking at um, their, equal, uh, their equality on this uh, fairness metric, um, found that just doing this kind of uh, disparity agnostic model selection strategy um, led us to, to a model that, uh, although had similar levels of recall across black and white individuals, had much lower levels for, for Hispanic and, and individuals with un, unknown race and ethnicity. So then we want to see, well, could we uh, make some adjustments to this model that, that we'd selected, um, make some adjustments uh, to the way that we were selecting individuals based on that model to improve the fairness of the model. Um, and here we did this simply by uh, nudging the score thresholds that were being used to um, select the, the top 150 individuals up or down for, for different groups to, to try to equalize recall. And then wanted to look at the, the trade-offs, uh, what, what impact that had on, on the overall efficiency, the precision at 150 of those models. Um, we, I won't, maybe I'll kind of skip over, over this, uh, but we looked at different strategies of whether we equalize the, the recall exactly or, or actually kind of lean more heavily into to groups with historical disparities to try to uh, close um, gaps uh, and skip through some of those slides, just give sort of the, the top line result. Um, where here we found uh, that we could actually um, nudge those uh, scores around a little bit to, to equalize recall. Um, and, and only saw a very modest uh, decrease in, in the overall precision, so precision at 150, which is measuring the efficiency of the models. Um, whether we were equalizing recall directly or, or actually uh, trying to, to focus a little bit more heavily, focus more resources on, on groups with um, kind of historical and underlying disparities. Uh, so there we found relatively low trade-off. Um, this is something that we're we're looking at across more policy contexts as well, and, and something that we'll look at uh, in the, the Donors Choose Notebook. Um, so I think, why don't we go ahead and, and jump back over to that and see, in that case, uh, when we're looking at um, how we might mitigate uh, bias, either through pre-processing and processing or, or post-processing, um, what the impact is on our ability, one, to get a, a model that um, performs more fairly and two, to um, uh, get models that perform well on, on kind of accuracy metrics. Uh, so Pedro, maybe I'll let you jump back over to sharing. Oh, great. And, and right already. Uh, yeah, I just posted the, the collab the, link. Collab link. Yeah, I think the other, while well, Pedro's loading, 
Pedro yeah, Stolen. Pedro's mm -hmm. muted if he, oh, yeah. I think, was trying to talk. The example that Kit was talking about, um, that's, an, that's a useful case study to sort of communicate some of these things to policymakers, this sort of policy menu. The, 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 there's a paper that's in the, on the web page as well um, that goes deeper into that case study. So if you're kind of looking at sort of how do we communicate some of these options uh, to mediate between policy goals and, and outcomes, that's a good, good example of that. Sorry about being muted. Um, uh, so uh, in this uh, notebook for bias reductions, um, we will um, use uh, um, some specific, some simple utils uh, methods for the pre-processing with sampling, uh, with the equalizing recall or equal equality of opportunity as in the paper of Marit Sart. And on the in-processing, we are actually going to use an external library, which is uh, the Fair Learn. That's why we need to install it here on this part. So just kind of a, a recapping. So what uh, we did before, um, we trained a bunch of uh, different models and these different models have different um, uh, learners, different algorithms, different type of parameters. And uh, basically, um, here it's just we are uh, repeating that case of checking out what was the best model uh, and uh, here we will create a, a, a method that will create an overview kind of a zoom out or in terms of bias and fairness on all overall models so before on the single model audit we started with just looking to performance distribution in terms of precision at 1000 uh, and now we are going to as it shows before this to unfold of a new dimension in terms of bias and fairness by uh, running that for specific uh, groups and in this case we are going to do this high level comparison of models in terms of performance and fairness looking at the poverty level and just, um, sorry, Pedro, you might want to do this too, but anyone who's following along in the notebook, under view, uh, you might want to click expand sections. For whatever reason, Coab like collapse, when you have a notebook with a lot of sections, they collapse a bunch of them. Um, and it'll be uh, a little easier to follow along if you expand them. Thank you, Kit. Um, and so uh, this is an overview of uh, the best model in terms of precision actually sits when comparing also in terms of TPR disparities for poverty level. And we can see that the model we uh, audit before in depth was this one. In this zoom out, we can see all these other models, how they um, behave in terms of um, disparity for TPR for poverty level as well. And we can do that for every Every, so, every so just Pedro, when, if you show that, right? So just by looking at that, right? We, without doing any extra work, we can sort of say, well, we could have just picked, like we picked a, we pretty much picked an arbitrarily random one, right? It was slightly higher than uh, the second best one, but the on the y-axis, the, the variance is pretty pretty high. The, the disparities could be four, or could, it could be two, and we picked one that was like two point seven five. So, so that's kind of one, just one, this is the model selection phase, right? If we care about disparities on poverty level, um, this gives us without doing any extra work. Um, now there's no reason to believe that one should be more fair than the other because we weren't, we weren't designing for fairness. We just tried a bunch of, what we did in the background was, you know, tried all models and lots of hyperparameters and this is just what came out. Um, but even that without thinking about it, here, it gives us a, a, a way to do this in model selection phase of pick a better model if that's what you care about. And actually, I forgot to mention that in, in, these, in these, the way this is, is, this is plotted, uh, what is optimal would be something like here, so, uh, um, or like here. So uh, we want to uh, maximize uh, uh, precision and you want to have the disparity close to one because it means that all the groups are uh, equal in terms of uh, their, their group specific uh, recall uh, that is our target metrics for in terms of bias and fairness. And now the same plot for the metro type. Um, and here we see again also the model selected disparities, um, another models that kind of 
improve in terms of disparity, but they sacrifice a little bit uh, the overall precision. And for teacher sex, we have the same model again, but now as a higher disparity. Uh, and we have all these different uh, options here if we are just looking for this individual attribute when selecting. Uh, and that's, I mean, if you just look at that, you'll see that there is so much variance on the disparity, right? It, it's each of these uh, without much movement uh, on, on, the, on the precision. So, so even that is a useful way to just sort of show like, look, we don't have to do any more work. We can just pick something that, that's better uh, and, and not sacrifice too much. That's not a generally true result, right? That we're, if for this problem, it looks like that. The other problems we've worked on where there's, I and mean, we're gonna show that, right? There's either zero trade-off, which you can get come down, or you have to go all the way back to a random model. Your precision has to go down to pretty much random in order to get to get you know parity. So that there is, it doesn't mean that the model like that exists, but you know, if you're doing any sort of work like this, this is the first thing you should sort of do is just plot this and see is there a really cheap way of picking a different model before before I go to do too many complicated things. And also to complement what Razor said, uh, this is uh, here on the specific test set. That doesn't necessarily uh, mean that the same model configuration in the future will actually have sit on exactly the same quadrant or in terms of bias and fairness. So um, it's not exactly what it uh, also mentioned. Um, so let's try out our first strategy for bias reduction. And what we are going to do now is to, so what we've seen was evaluations on test sets for all these models on in terms of uh, Akita's results and uh, performance. And now, if we wanna do some resampling, we're going to do that on the training set in order to change the model uh, and to affect the model. So we are going to sample on the training set, change the distributions. We'll build a new, uh, rebuild the model and uh, we will uh, see how that actually impacts on the test set that we don't change. We don't. We are not changing the test set. We are just sampling the training set. And let's start to load that all that um, data. And we're ignoring again, you know, in the details underneath, which is, you know, if you're, if there are any other tuning you're doing, you're going to have to leave out a validation set and all that kind of stuff, which we're going to be doing underneath. But this is and, just... yeah, and for simplification, we are not training again the old grid with the new samples. We are just picking the same model configuration that was selected as IS precision, just to showcase that um, this this type of, of approach. So we are going to keep the hyperparameters. And now, what we are going to define in this case, let's uh, have a look to poverty level. Our group of interest is highest, and our average group is lower in terms of poverty. And here is what we can see. You can see the, the, the in terms of the size of the groups, uh, how these two groups compares on the training data. And we can also have a look to the prevalence um, in terms of uh, getting unfunded or not meeting the funding uh, goals, uh, how this is distributed uh, in terms of prevalence for the two, uh, for the two uh, groups for poverty level. And here in terms of sizes, we have um, they are similar, but the uh, highest is uh, actually 9,000 and the lower is 7,000. This is just a helper just to give us some group specific stats. And what this shows us is that, um, as we're saying, the highest one is 944.8, the group, the prevalent specific is 0 0.033, and for lower, uh, which is a slightly smaller group and has higher prevalence. And this is kind of uh, answers this question, what types of uh, disparities we see in terms of the training data. So we have slightly different group sizes and way different uh, prevalence uh, on the these two groups. And now we have these just uh, simple um, options, approaches. Uh, one would be just, let's have a look how if we just sample uh, or we undersample the largest group to be the same size as the smallest group. Second option would be 
to um, uh, undersample the group with uh, uh, lower prevalence, so it gets higher prevalence. And uh, uh, the third option is actually doing both at the same time. So adjusting the prevalence and adjusting the um, group size on the training data. And again, this is this is coming from the assumptions we were talking about before, right? So if you've got a small minority group, the model may not may get dominated by the larger group. So if, if we make the group sizes the same, the, 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 that's the hypothesis that, that then the model will treat them equally um, and, and, and be equally accurate across the two. The other one is if one group has a much higher percentage of ones than the other, that's affecting the model. So if we make them equal, or some you know closer to each other, then the model will 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 kind of correct itself. So those are kind of we're not endorsing those approaches. So that's one thing. Like we 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 don't think you should you know that that's 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 the right hypothesis. So that's the right thing to do. That's the hypothesis behind anybody who's doing sampling in order to correct for bias. That's the that's the assumption they're making. So what we're doing is we're like let's do that and then see what happens. Um, do one, do the second one, and do both. And now we can test that out and, and see what the impact is. So yeah, so basically this util function here will do that. So in the first case, we are just equalizing the group size. And basically these are the numbers we had before. And now, because we undersampled, the largest group now has the same size as the smallest group. On the second strategy, we are equalizing prevalence. So uh, uh, what we are going to do is to get the, uh, under sample the level negatives from the group with lower prevalence. So we get higher prevalence as the, as the other group with higher prevalence. And here we actually don't get the same group size, but we get the same prevalence. And on third, we'll get both. So at the end, what we do is that we get two groups on the training data is they have the exact same size and they have the exact same prevalence. And We'll run this, and, and also, again, as Raid was saying, in this particular case, we actually had similar group sizes. It might be the case that we have so such a smaller group that we cannot actually under if we undersample, yeah, we'll really really change the model we get. Um, and now let's just build the uh, retrain and test using the same hyperparameters of the model with IS precision, and we will now get new bunch of predictions for each one of these three approaches, each one of these three new models that we rebuilt. And let's have a look to a uh, different precision of the three models. Um, slightly differences over the three, but what really matters now is going over the fairness. Um, also, we have here no till to run the Akita's audit um, in a more straightforward way. We have the same reference groups we had before, same metrics and same uh, threshold. Uh, let's load the predictions of the previous model that we had. It's actually the same thing that we had on the single model audit. And now let's have a look to the uh, results we had before for poverty level. If you recall, we got um, uh, three, uh, almost three times lower TPR, uh, lower recall for IS poverty, and now, Let's have a look to uh, the audit of the first approach, which was just equalizing the group sizes. And actually, it didn't change uh, on the poverty level, the disparities, neither on the metro type or the teacher sex. And, and again, intuitively, you know, we had 9,000 examples from, from one, 7,000 from the other one. We made them both 7,000. Yeah, probably not going to do much to the model, right? So, so not surprising um, that, that it didn't change very much. And now let's equalize prevalence and actually run the audit for uh, the second model. And um, when we uh, push up the prevalence of the group with, um, with lower prevalence, which was the highest poverty, um, it um, actually re resulted that on the test set, um, the recall gap between the two, disparity between the two groups um, get uh, closer. So basically by equalizing the recall, we are pushing more examples of the IS poverty to the top 1000. And again, the, the other thing to keep in mind here is this is looking at 
disparity, right? So it's 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 possible that it it reduced one way to reduce disparity is to make everything worse. If you if you have you know you can get perfect parity if both of them have a horrible recall, zero recall. Uh, so so this is we don't know actually what happened until we mouse over it and we see the actual numbers, right? It could be that both of the this, both of the, the TPRs went down, uh, both recalls went down. Um, so you know, right now it's what 0 0.08 and and point uh, eleven. And then before uh, it was. Uh, it was uh, 14 and 04, 004. Right. So, so, so the recall for the reference group came down and the recall for the other, uh, for the highest priority group went up and, and they became closer, um, but because, yeah. yeah. Exactly. exactly. And we'll, we'll come back, we'll, we'll, we'll basically put this, these back on the scatter plot to see the trade-off afterwards once we're done with this. Um, Kind of uh, randomly, actually, uh, make worse the the the, the gap uh, based on teacher sex. So actually, push even more the the higher the recall and improve the recall on 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 female teacher sex. And that's and that's not a that's not an isolated case. Often the there are these underlying correlations, right? So basically, th this this seems like that there is, and this sort of helps us think about that, right? Where, where there might be there's a correlation between the sex uh the gender of the of the teacher submitting the project and possibly the uh the was the metro type that went down uh yeah the metro type went down a little bit and, and the yeah and and then the, the the school being urban or and so we might not be able to get both of them and that's something we want to be able to look at and now on the third uh, approach which is equalizing both group sizes and the prevalence And now it actually it pushes a little bit more um, this one, but actually, as Ray was mentioning, it doesn't necessarily means that it's actually improving the recall for both because what we have here is the exactly same recall on the second approach, so zero zero eight, but it's pushing lower uh, down, pushing down the recall on the uh, reference group. So basically, in the beginning, we had 0, 014, 0, 0, 004. We run the, 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 the sample on prevalence, and it went to 0, 0, 008 on the, on the highest poverty and 0, 011 on the lower, lower, lower poverty. And now it didn't change the recall on highest poverty. It just pushed push down the recall on the, on the reference group. Uh, so basically, this means that. Uh, um the 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 model was uh, actually um reducing the precision on on that specific uh, group and for the other ones they the widening the gaps still are still there and now let's let's do the overview which is we are going to add these three different approaches to the scatter plot that we have seen before And um, basically, this was the previous model that we added, the one with ice uh, precision. This is the model of the first approach, just sampling the group sizes. And these two happen, in this case, to be here. Um, this one is the uh, equalizing both group size and, um, and, uh, and the prevalence. And as you've seen, because it it, it is actually reducing the recall on the reference group. Basically, it's as lower precision than the group of, this, of the model of the second approach. It has a slightly higher disparity, but as higher precision that, than this sample. And this sampling was done using a specific random seed. If we change the random seed, we'd probably would get uh, different, uh, different results. We actually were for simplification, we are just undersampling on the level negatives of the group with the higher prevalence. We can think about other ways of doing the undersampling. And uh, this for sure will probably will result in on, on different um, results as well. 
Um, anything here to wrap up or shall I move to the reduction? I would just quickly run through because we've got five minutes. Okay, so the, for the fair learn, it's a easy to use package. It's basically based on a specific method that was proposed by um, Microsoft Research, which is an ensemble of cost sensitive uh, weaker um, uh, learners. It can be a decision tree, it can be a logistic creation, it can be a random forest, it just needs to have a fit and predict. And then it has this bunch of constraints. And in this case, we are going to use as constraint uh, the equalizing of the true positive rate difference. And it has a specific um, hyperparameters as the tolerance that we can get, the number of iterations. Um, it's a very nice uh, documented um, uh, package, so um, you can you can later see all the different things you can you can run. They even have a grid that you can try different parameters and see how it affects. And because this is uh, this constraint optimization approach, it can take uh, quite a lot. I uh, actually have another project with uh, this is just uh, a small data set with uh, hundreds of thousands of instances. This is um, quite slow, uh, but that's not the main criteria to uh, select the, the, um, the method. And now what happens? So in order to fulfill the constraints, what this method ended up uh, doing is selecting as positive many more instances than before. And this uh, method does not give us an inter interface to a score between zero and one. It just gives us binary predictions. Uh, so in this case, um, the only way to fulfill our resource constraints is to randomly sampling uh, the top uh, positive predictions of the model. So randomly sampling 1,000 from these uh, 6,500 instances. And of course, we can already expect that we'll have a cost oh, in terms of precision, uh, selecting so many as positives. And then let's run the Akitas. Let's remind, uh, recall the old one. It's, this is the model without any mitigation. And now the model based on reductions, it improved the disparity. Um, but now let's see how it actually uh, performs in terms of precision. So before we had 0 0.55 and now we have 0 0.40. So there's a high cost in terms of performance metric. Once again, because the method to fulfill that constraint, it basically end up predicting as positive uh, many, many, many more instances. And let's see how it looks like in terms of the scatter. We don't have much time. So basically what we found is a model that has lower um, disparity, but it's way far from the model with highest precision. And it's not even close of the other bunch of models here that uh, are in a more interesting um, subregion of the space. And now going to the third approach, Keith, you want to talk or maybe? Oh, yeah, I mean, I just get say, but yeah, we should jump into the third approach quickly, but but that is a, a general challenge of a lot of the in-processing methods is if you have a resource, you know, if you're, it's assuming under the hood, this like 0.5 threshold for assigning ones and zeros and then optimizing these fairness metrics around that. But if you need to either have a different threshold or you have a constraint, you can only select a top K value, adding that into the optimization problem, um, one, you know, methodologically very challenging, uh, and two, in terms of uh, methods that exist out there. So anyone who's thinking about research uh, avenues, that's, I think, an, an interesting direction to, to go as well. Um, but it, yeah, I let you jump into the, the next. Yeah. Uh, so on the third part, um, what we're going to do um, very quickly, and I will uh, run it all, is we are going to uh, adjust uh, thresholds so we have equal recall for different groups. So basically, a simple, straightforward implementation of this is we um, basically pick on a previous per time period and a different uh, model before. We need to understand uh, how many instances for each group on the top instances for each group we will pick. A uh, straightforward way to do that is to uh, basically uh, split the predictions on different groups 
and then calculate the cumulative recall for the instances sorted by the predictions. And then we merge that again on all the groups. We sort by this cumulative recall and then we have a, a equal, uh, as we go down the list, we don't longer look to the predictions, we are actually looking to the cumulative recall. So we have an equal threshold when we define we'll stop here, we'll have the same recall for uh, uh, all the groups. Of course, it may, might be some jumps there, but usually it's very straightforward to uh, apply this equal, equalizing. And now I uh, will just uh, run because I think the wrap up is uh, important. Um, Basically, we went to we went to a previous fold to understand what would be a good uh, the, the the number of instances for different groups that we would select. So when we do that on the recent period and we apply that on the test, we have a more reliable uh, uh, assessment how, how that how that actually works. And here once again is previous model, and now after. Equalizing the recall, what we see in the test set is actually while before the IS, IS poverty was below the reference group, now is even higher for than the reference group on these uh, new adjustments. And while the in this case the the the, the global performance, the precision actually improved by doing this. And now let's have a look where we get here. So actually far away from previously. Yeah, and now there's some noise. So and now a wrapping up of all the methods we tried. And now the colors are a little bit different. So we have now the these, these colors for the various methods we tried. So initial best model, sampling groups, uh, sampling on the prevalence uh, on the group and prevalence, sampling on the prevalence and the equalizing post-hoc adjustments, equalizing uh, recall we, we get here. And maybe I'll stop sharing. And I, I think the, the kind of overall takeaway here is um, that, that we're not, you know, not necessarily endorsing or saying one of these is, is always going to work or, or the right answer in every context, um, so much as, as kind of saying, you know, these are often empirical things and, and you have to maybe try out different options and look at a large grid and, and look at the trade-offs um, and, and explore uh, what, what works in your context and, and with your constraints um, and then uh, and kind of go from there. And, and so one of the reasons to kind of walk through the notebook this way and, and um, provide you know, that code out there as a, as a jumping off resource um, is, is that uh, you know, you may want to try some of these pre-processing and processing and post-processing methods uh, and then look at what works well. I think in our, our own work, often in these resource-constrained um, uh, kind of policy contexts, uh, we are finding the, the post-hoc adjustments to, to be pretty reliable. Um, but again, that, that may be, you know, kind of particular to, to that, that context. Um, and you may, you know, your mileage may vary, I guess. Yeah. Um, so this is this is an example of across a bunch of real projects. So so the blue blue one is this donors choose, but the other ones are are real projects that we're working on. Basically, you is the one that's kind of the optimized for you know efficiency precision at the top k or recall the top k metric, and then the the corresponding ones are the the one with the post hoc corrections that we just talked about, and we're finding pretty much in all of them that we get from different levels of disparity to pretty much parity without losing anything in the precision top case. So again, this is not a theoretical result, but we're finding empirically in resource constrained problems where we're doing assistive interventions and we care about recall parity, the post hoc correction method seems to outperform um, pretty much anything else. And again, intuitively, it's, you know, the, the sampling approaches are kind of modifying the data in the hope that the models change. The regularization in processing are giving it an additional constraint and hoping that something in the middle exists that can be achieved, uh, with the caveat that Kit and Pedro said that they're not necessarily designed to, to adjust 
top K problems, right? So that's a big, big um, gap. The post hoc one is the one that's most directly saying, can I, can I pick different numbers of people from, from each group such that uh, they are the highest risk people and such that the recall is equal. So that's kind of designing the optimization problem directly. Right now, we've only designed it for sort of recall because it's monotonically increasing versus other metrics. But if you're working on these types of problems, you know, as Kit said, is is try try different things and kind of compare and see which one which one works. Um, and yeah, so I think that's mostly what we had. Right again, the takeaways um, are just remembering to kind of the model that we're building is important, but measuring overall things is of overall outcomes what we care about. Um, looking at sort of, you know, what's a more bias aware workflow per project, um, and then looking at different sources of bias, looking at what metrics you might care about through this fairness tree, and then auditing and, and, and exploring, and then looking at, you know, which one would you compare to what, compared to what's happening today, what the status quo is. Um, and then again, if you're in a, in a place, in a workplace where you are doing these types of things, it's important to sort of create a structure to, to make, make sure it actually happens, right? Because often in, in some places, this, this is kind of an overhead where, oh, we have to do these things because somebody's telling us. And so how do you, you know, there's a lot of other stuff you have to think about. So how do we embed this into your workflow and as part of whether it's QA or other types of things. Um, and then, yeah, so we've got the, here are the links that the, everything we showed today is on our on the GitHub repo and it's going to it's going to stay there. So so take a look and um, and, you know, um, if you have ideas on improving things, changing things, ping us. We'll stick around for a few minutes now uh, if people have questions. Um, but yeah, also feel free to, you know, um, we're easy to find. Um, so. So ping us if you have any suggestions or more questions or not, or, or want to work on these types of projects. Um, you know, we're happy to. And there's a bunch of other resources we've added here. Um, but yeah, thanks for thanks for participating today. Uh, and yeah, we'll stick around for a few minutes um, if people have questions. Yeah, thank thank you all again for for joining. Uh, and thank you.